Okay, I think I'm live. Let's find out if uh, anybody's out there. I can see some uh, questions in the uh, chat. The uh, system is telling me I'm live. You tell me. Can you hear me? You can hear me. We can start answering questions here. I'll just wait. To... Ah, you can hear me. We're good. Ready to go. Okay, so this is uh, a session for Level 3 CFA candidates, those who finish Level 2 moving on to Level 3, anybody at Level 1 who has questions about how they should be positioning to succeed at Level 3, and for any Level 3 candidates now. So <clears throat> I will try to avoid any questions that are market related. Somebody's saying, what do you think of the yen? I'm going to, I'll avoid that. If at the end we have, we have some time, uh, maybe I can um, answer some of those. So <clears throat> let's begin. Uh, let's see. I wonder if consecutive questions on the exam belong to the same topic. First 25 questions are for ethics. Next 20 are for quants. Or are they mixed up in random order? Well, level three <clears throat> is a mix of vignette followed by structured response, vignette followed by structured response. Each vignette uh, will be on a particular topic section. Each structured response will be on a particular topic section. So it's not as if there are 20 questions and then 25. Not as if the first four uh, item sets that you get to will be uh, economics and X3 will be fixed income. It will be randomized, both in the first part of the exam and the second part of the exam. Uh, what should be our strategy for the remaining 136 days? Well, that's that's a lot of time, the remaining 136 days. You, you, you first of all, have to learn uh, the content while learning and reviewing should happen concurrently, right? You learn, review, learn, review, learn, review, so that you don't forget the original stuff you learned. I'll have gone through the videos once by mid-October and solved 10 cues, 10 questions, <laughs> 10 cues from each chapter from MMQ Bank, scoring about 60%. So, uh, you know, I, I get that question a lot, what should be uh, the strategy? And I would seem to think that by this time, uh, you would pursue those strategies that work well for you. Uh, this is your third exam, at least, at least the third exam. You've already had a level one, level two. Maybe some of you had multiple level one and level twos before you got here. Uh, you've also got an undergrad career behind you where you've written lots of midterms, lots of final exams. Uh, and there is a particular study strategy that you have coalesced around per exam that works for you. I would seem to think that, that if you take at level three, I'd say the five weeks before the exam, 35 days, and you say, okay, well, I have a final exam in 35 days. Use what works for you in those 35. I don't know that there is a strategy that I would say, here's the strategy and everybody uses this one strategy. Uh, what works for you is what works for you. Do that. Whatever it was. And you should have enough history behind you now to know what works for you. Do that um, with 35 days to go. You know, once you get close to 35 the learning should be, the learning should be complete, and you should be, um, you should be in review mode uh, by that point. Uh, let's see. I've been going through 2018 content. Is there new material significantly different? Yes, yes, it is. And perhaps do you go further detail? Do I go further detail from 2018? Uh, okay, so I don't know what 2018 you're referring to. I have no 2018 content, content anywhere on level three, um, anywhere, unless you mean those few videos I have. Well, I don't even have those on YouTube anymore. I've taken all the CFA content off of YouTube. Um, so I don't know what 2018 you're referring to. So I can't, I can't use what you 
are suggesting as a benchmark for answering the question, do I go into further detail? Because I don't know what 2018 content you're using. Um, and nowhere in your question do you explicitly say level three. So if you mean level one, um, I guess it would be my same question is what are you referring to? I'll pass on that one. Let's say I pass level two next Thursday. When is the best time to start preparation for level three for August? What is the right order of learning? August is a long time away. If you pass level three uh, next Thursday, take some time off. Enjoy uh, enjoy the holidays coming up. I mean, you'll that's what mid October that you'll find out. Um, I think if you start in January uh, for August for level three, that's that's enough time that you're not rushing. Uh, and not so much time that you lose motivation or you lose direction and you end up meandering in different ways. Um, you could take some time off. You can afford to take the time off uh, if you're if you're going for August, sure. As far as the um, order of learning, um, I always suggest starting with fixed income because it is... Mm, it's the longest in terms of page count. It's the longest section. It's also probably the most challenging because you have three unique, um, three unique streams in fixed income. You have the whole concept of immunization, which takes up the first two readings. You have the whole concept of yield curve strategies uh, that you can follow. And then you have the whole concept of credit strategies that you can follow. So there are three streams there, and they're all equally important. So it would not be, I think, uh, difficult to, to assess the probability of at least two of those three showing up on the exam, if not all three questions on all three of those big topics. And because it's the more challenging one, cognitively speaking, uh, uh, I would seem to think you'd want to start there. You don't want to run out of time on fixed income because you can't learn in a hurry, but you can, if you start early, take extra time on fixed income uh, because you have, you, you started with enough time. So if you start there and then maybe go to capital market expectations, um, yeah, I think that would be. And then after that, I don't really think it matters at level three what you go to. So, that would be, I guess that would be the best answer I have there. Not able to pass level two exam after three attempts. Love the material, especially since using a platform. But when do you drop the ego and decide you're not cut out for these exams? Okay, well, so two, two, two issues with, with that question. Um, I don't know if it's dropping the ego. Uh, saying that. You know, I can't pass these exams. Let me let me drop the ego. I I, I don't know that 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 I would use that word uh, or, or use that term. Uh, maybe raise the ego uh, uh, the other way, not drop it. Uh, you've tried three times, you haven't made it. That's got to be if you have if you if you have excessive ego, that would have been a blow to your ego each time. Maybe it's not high enough. You know, maybe maybe you need to raise that. Uh, not cut out for the exams versus not cut out for the industry. You know, which one, which one are we talking about? If, if you decide that you're not cut out for the industry, then yeah, then, then, then okay. But you start by saying you love the material. So I don't, I don't know that we can get from, I love the material to I'm not cut out for the industry. So I think we could take that out, not cut out for the exam. Well, that's just an exam that you have to write. Their strategy for um, uh, for preparing for an exam uh, that that can be followed by just decomposing what it is you have done and try to figure out well what's not working for you. What would be a better approach? Uh, you love the material, which means you should love the industry, but not everybody is a good test taker. And well, you got to get through these exams. So there's a difference between saying, I love what I do, uh, but I hate 
this process, this this idea of studying for an exam and testing on an exam, and I I have a problem there, but everything else is fine. Well, that's that's fixable. So I I I I, I, I would take your your question and say I think you need to raise your ego, not lower your ego. You can do this. It's not that you can't. You can do this. Uh, it's not the industry. It's not the content. It's not the material. It's the process of the exam where there's a problem that can be fixed by decomposing what you've done and, and coming up with a better strategy. So no, I, I, this, this, the way you've asked it does not sound like somebody that should move on. Uh, where can I purchase the hat? Do you plan to have more hat sales in the future? Uh, I don't know if we're doing the hat sale anymore. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be doing any more in the future. Uh, that's beyond my pay grade, I think. Um, but I don't think we have a hat sale this year. So they are, whatever's out there are limited editions. Maybe eBay, somebody selling them now for $1,200, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. How much detail should be included in the short response? None. As far as detail, no detail. What you're trying to do is you're trying to answer the question as directly as possible. You are telling the greater what the answer is. At no point in time are you going to take any, uh, uh, any words in any attempt to teach the greater why the answer is the answer. So if the answer is low risk tolerance, you say low risk tolerance. If it just, if it says select uh, is this high risk tolerance or low, for example, the most direct answer is low or high, whatever it is. It's not asking you for anything else. Look at the keywords and only answer what's being asked. You don't have to teach the grader why the answer is the answer. It's not an essay question. One to two bullet points maximum, maximum is is uh, what these answers require and you get to the point you do not have to demonstrate to the greater why you know the answer you only have to demonstrate to the greater that you know the answer that's it if you're on sentence five sentence six word 50 word 55 too much way 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 too much Five, 10, 20 words tops, one, two bullet points tops. That's it. Get to the point. Every question has a very direct answer. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you please, oh, I just lost that. Can you please, where to go, where to go? Complete the remaining chapters on derivatives and futures by John Hall. No, I can't. No, I cannot. I um, I don't have the bandwidth for it. I don't have the time for it. Um, yeah, I'll have to pass on that. Level three is the easiest uh, and would it need less prep time. What prep strategy you recommend or is it tricky to have this approach? Level one is the easiest. Eh, well, you know, I level one is the shortest in terms of page count fact. Level, uh, sorry, level three. Um, level three also has uh, the highest pass rate of level one, two, three fact. But does that make it the easiest? Or is it just that those who get past level one and level two uh, have learned from their study mistakes and are better prepared to study at level three, more focused at level three. And if you get past level one and level two, uh, you probably have the aptitude for test taking that helps you for level three. So is it is it is it true that when we look at the facts, you know, higher pass rate at level three than two and one, can we conclude that, well, it's because it's easier or can we conclude that it's because that by the time you get past the second one, those candidates who, who do are just a better population uh, uh, of test takers than you'd get at level one. 
I don't know that I would say that level three is easier. Um, it's different. It's not so textbook. Level one is, is, is declarative. A lot of declarative knowledge. It's a lot of know this, know that. Uh, and getting you up to speed with the vocabulary of the industry. Uh, level two is a process level, valuation. It's, you know, uh, still very textbook. Most of that stuff you find in textbooks. Level three is as close as, is a nice big giant step away from the textbook into the real world. And you start seeing some strategies because it's a portfolio management level. You see some strategies that are actually carried out in the real world in a very simplified way, not with all the messiness and detail of the real world, but it's real. It's as real as you can get without actually being on a floor somewhere. So I don't know that it's easy. It's different. Uh, it's a different exam, especially with structured response. I just think that a level three candidate uh, is better prepared psychologically for what an exam looks like. Uh, and with one exam standing between them and being done, I think there's also a higher motivation at level three to lean into it a bit more. Level one, you're just starting the path seems so long, right? But this is it. This is the last mile. Uh, when you know it's the last mile, you tend to push just a little bit harder because this is it. I can see the finish line. There it is. So I think it has more to do with the other things. So as far as prep strategy goes, understand level one. If The best way to, to, to sort of convey this is to use a, a learning taxonomy. And Bloom's is one of the better learning taxonomies. It's got six levels of learning. We know that the first level is not really learning. It's just called recall or remembering. Um, I can memorize a couple of pages of um, an advanced medical book, textbook, and I can pass an exam if the exam stays uh, true to the textbook. I can pass an exam, but I won't know what the hell any of it means. So recall is the lowest form of learning because you don't even actually have to know what the hell you're talking about as long as you could just regurgitate things or repeat things. You get this a lot from uh, first and second year university students who, who say things like, well, you know what Mark says, and you know what Weber says, and you know what so-and-so says. Well, great, great, great. You're wonderful at repeating stuff that you've learned somewhere, but do you even know what it means? Um, moving up from there, right, is, is where you start to get higher levels of learning. Level one really is the first three levels on Bloom's taxonomy. Level two will push into the fourth uh, level, uh, the type of learning. And level three really focuses on the uh, on the top levels of learning, uh, the uh, analysis, evaluation, and synthesis, which you it's doubtful you'd get those types of questions at level one. Uh, level two may be here and there, but level three is primarily that. It would be, I don't even think at level three, you'd get a question that anywhere resembles your ability to remember something. So a uh, multiple choice at level one, you can read it and you can look at the three options. You can go, oh, I remember. I remember it's this one. You can recall your way through some of the level one questions. I don't think you can recall your way through any of the level three questions. So it does require a higher level of learning, um, which some people can't make that make that jump. Uh, or it eludes them, or they're still preparing for a level three exam the way they would for level one and level two. You know, really stopping at 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 the understanding uh, uh, or application level. So there's recall, understanding, application, and they're really stopping at application and not moving on to uh, evaluation, analysis, and, thins, and synthesis. So it 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 uh, uh, more often than not is probably a limitation there understand that preparing for level three, you're not remembering things. You're, you're sort of just thinking about, well, let's take um, an example from fixed income uh, yield curve strategies, for example. And I say the yield curve is going to do a certain thing. Um, what would you do? 
Well, there, the, you're not going to memorize your way through that answer. You're going to have to understand, well, what does that curve, what does that movement in the yield curve mean? What does that mean for different bonds? To know what it means, I have to know what my sensitivity is at different parts of the curve. And once I know my sensitivities, then I can determine whether I should be overweight or underweight. So it's not just a matter of buy or sell because yield curves do this, right? They do all sorts of things. They twist, they change their slopes, they rise, they fall. Now it's not a matter of buy, sell. It's like, well, buy, sell where? Where on the curve do I do it based on how it's moving? So you have, you have to analyze what's going on uh, and, and evaluate your options. Well, I could do this, or I could do this, or I could hear three portfolios that you can choose given what's going on on the curve. Which one do you pick? Well, you're not going to memorize your way through a context-specific question like that. So uh, I would say for level three, you know, think about it, not just in, okay, if A, then B. Think about it, if A, all of these things are possible. You know, depending on what what the conditions are that A happens under. Let me see if I answered that question. It doesn't need less time. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that it needs less time. I will say this. If you have done well at level one and level two, in other words, you don't have a lot of holes in your knowledge at level one and level two, level three probably would require less time than level one or two. But if you got through level one and level two, <clears throat> statistically, you got through level one and level two, meaning that um, it just so happened that the questions worked out in such a way that you knew those things, but that there was a whole bunch of stuff you did not know, but you got lucky in the types of questions didn't ask that. You'll show up at level three with some holes in your knowledge, Level three will seem rather challenging because you'll always be saying, oh, what's this? What's that? When did we learn this? When did we learn that? Well, level one and level two. There's nothing at level three that you haven't seen at level one and level two, unless you didn't see it at level one and level two, then suddenly level three is very challenging. It's going to take a whole bunch of time because some of that time, <clears throat> you got to go back to level one and level two and review some readings. So... I think I answered that, or at least I gave you enough information on that to, to go somewhere. Does your applied option course contain exotic options? No. No, it does not. I'm hoping we could see. Um, the applied uh, really is meant, is targeted more for the retail, uh, the retail investor. So, the option strategies can be complex. The options are not exotic. It's very rare that a retail investor would bump into a, an exotic option. Uh, even an institutional investor would have to be some, doing something interesting to bump into an exotic option. So uh, it's not, uh, no, it's not there. Hoping we could see comments on the MM site for lectures and questions again, even though they're just archive comments and no new comments are added. <clears throat> so the, the um, problem, and it was a problem, problem slash solution, why don't we say that? The, the issue with it is that it is... Um, <clears throat> hugely expensive to answer questions. You need somebody knowledgeable at level three to answer those questions. It's hugely expensive. It's not scalable. <clears throat> that means that as you add more and more users, you have to add more and more expense to answer those questions because they scale with the number of users because there's a certain expected value uh, of questions, You know, the number of questions asked per user that you add. Um, <clears throat> there is a small group every year, every year, a very small group, tiny group that pretty much dominate the questions. 60% of all questions are asked by less than 1% of the users. Um, roughly 40% of users never ask a question. So how do you, <clears throat> if you decide that you're going to do it and it's non-scalable, how do you begin to charge for that? Because it does have a real cost. There is a cost of getting that done. It's not free. Um, 
do you charge everybody even though 40 percent don't use it and if you do you make your um you make your education a little bit more inaccessible uh to everyone do you say well you can add on uh an option for answering questions uh, and if you do uh is there a limit uh, and if there isn't well then it gets incrementally more expensive for the 60 percent when less than one percent would use the majority of it and we, you lose money on the one percent so it becomes difficult to structure a price for that we are experimenting right now with an algorithm that once given our content once given our videos uh is in early testing quite impressive with answering questions now that is scalable so we have to get to the point where we move from a non-scalable feature, which would have a very expensive cost, to a scalable feature, which has great benefit, but very little cost. Uh, it is, in the end, a business, right? This is, uh, we're not a charity. Uh, and as much as I uh, uh, am a big fan of something I call compassionate capitalism, uh, you can't be compassionate to the point of just losing losing money because then you are of no value to anyone. We are working on a way to bring that back in a way that is scalable and adds value. Having nobody answer the questions doesn't have value. Having other people, other candidates answer the questions does have value. However, you also need a moderator. You need someone to check that the answer is, in fact, correct. Otherwise, the person who asked the question risks learning the wrong thing and failing. So we can't be party to a system which you thereby learn the wrong thing. In exchange for removing the comments, what we've done is we've, we have tutors at a very subsidized cost, $65, I think is the cost per hour. I don't know that you're gonna get charter holders tutoring you for anything less than that anywhere else in the world, less than that cost. Uh, we have increased the number of office hours that we provide uh, by quite a bit. At level three, if you look in the, the list of uh, videos, way at the very bottom, there's a folder that says seminars. I've taken six of the more complex readings and overlaid them with seminars that explain it from a different perspective. And they're meant to be watched after the main video. So you have that as well. So we've increased the number of scalable things that we can provide to remove the unscalable item that would end up uh, in a situation where we would have to raise our price significantly uh, to cover off something less than 100% use, that less than 60% use, and that less than 99% use most of the time. So. Okay. Can we post questions anymore on QBank anywhere else? Can we ask questions while prepping? At this point, no, until we solve this, this particular problem. And that's all part of keeping, keeping the costs low and accessible. And as I said, it's, it's when it comes down to it, if we, if we took, let's say the, we ranked everybody and you go to the top 10% of questions asked and you remove them we have very few questions, like very few questions. Uh, we'd get one or two questions a day. That would be it. Uh, but with the top 10% there, you end up with 80 to 100 every day. It's, you, simply, you simply can't keep up with that. It, it's, it simply can't be done. Uh, so uh, we're going to use technology, and we are moving fast on it. Believe me, we are moving very fast on it. We're going to use technology. And when we see that it's 80% there, good. We've got something. We know that if it works in this one area, we're testing it now. If it works, it'll work everywhere. Then we can roll it out uh, everywhere. So we are aware of the deficit. 
but we're also aware of the trade-off. Like, I mean, you see that deficit, but what you're not seeing is if you had this, this is what you'd pay. This is off. This is what you pay. And we're working on a solution. In the meantime, you have Reddit. We have the link for Reddit right on the site. Click there. You have a community of 80, 90,000 people, 100,000 uh, that uh, have shown themselves more than willing to answer questions, more than willing. Uh, so you have, you still have that huge, a uh, uh, huge resource. It uh, it seems to me, I think, redundant to increase our price to charge you for something of which there is a, an existing solution for. Uh, let's see, not directly related to L3, but more out of curiosity, how much time do you spend per day per week on following the markets, doing research? That's a tough one to answer. That's a tough one to answer because it's always there. I don't sit in front of my screen staring at staring at blinking lights, if that's what you mean. The morning it's on. I come down in the morning. I uh, have my coffee with maple syrup. Uh, and uh, Bloomberg is on because uh, the uh, through interactive brokers, you get Bloomberg for free. Bloomberg is on. It's just on. I'm not staring at it, but it's on. I'm aware of what's going on. Um, I'll check in several times during the day to see what's going on. If there are interesting things going on, I want to watch the price action on certain on certain things, especially around certain events. Big events, I'm always I'm always watching. The big events, the big ones are always the Fed decision days. You're always watching those. Whenever uh, any significant politician is giving a speech somewhere that has the potential to affect markets, you have to listen to it. Um, my news feed is pretty much dominated with Apple News based on what you click over time. Uh, you don't get certain things. So when I first started with Apple News, it was Kardashian. You know, there's a whole section on the Kardashians each time. I never once ever, ever clicked on that. I don't get it anymore. I don't even know what's going on with them, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but I'm not trying to keep up with them. So uh, see what I did there. Um, <clears throat> so it's all either uh, economy, technology. I click on, on a lot of that. Science, I click on a lot. And, uh, you know, business news, economics news, politics, that kind of stuff, because it's interesting. Uh, YouTube, I don't really waste my time on CAD videos. Uh, there are certain channels I like, certain videos I watch, and then every now and then something interesting shows up in the stream. Uh, and you're always reading uh, a 10K or a 10Q somewhere. You're always saying, hey, I wonder, I wonder what happened here, what's going on here. There's so many companies that, you know, uh, you're always looking at something. I don't count the hours per week, though. Uh, but it's 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 a career. Think about that. It's it's a career. You know, is is this are you entering this field because it's a career that you want to build or are you entering this field because it offers nice paychecks? Uh, if if you're just there for the paycheck and everything else is work. It's not going to take long before whoever gives you the paycheck is going to discover that this is not your thing, not by listening to you, but by when you get there, when you leave, and the level of work that you do. <clears throat> I'm not uh, good at accounting major. Does it mean I will not do well on finance, CFA? <clears throat> well, accounting is accounting. Uh, in CFA, you have two two points where it comes into contact with accounting level one uh, FSA financial statement analysis. And then level two, you have the same thing there where having a knowledge of the journal entries that created a certain uh, statement uh, amount is helpful, uh, but not necessary. So no, you don't have to be an accountant for this. You don't have to be an accountant to understand fixed income, to understand probability testing, uh, to understand regression, to understand economics, understand corporate finance, 
equity analysis, the valuation of derivatives, alternative, that you don't need to be an accountant for any of that stuff, any of that stuff. Financial statement analysis, well, you got to analyze these financial statements. So you need some understanding of balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, debits and credits, because that can get confusing. Um, but you don't necessarily have to know the transactions or the journal entries that created the outcomes. Knowing them makes it easier. Not knowing them is not a, is not a deal killer on that. Do you see new update on exam? It's necessary or valuable. New update on exam. Um, not sure what exam you're referring to. Like, I mean, I get it's CFA exam, but I'm not sure what 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 you mean by update. What you mean by, I guess I just don't know what you mean. <clears throat> um, the CFAI exam, any updates that they're going to make on that, whether they're necessary or valuable, I can't answer that question. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, it, it's too broad. If you could ask it again, a bit more narrow. Not directly, a little three, but more. Okay, I already did that, already did that. What do you think of the best resources to answer constructed response chapter wise rather than answering entire mock papers and just EOCQ? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, <clears throat> you you want reading by reading. Well, every reading at the end end of chapter questions, there are a few structured response questions, albeit they're they're not really exam type questions, they're more formative, formative knowledge questions as opposed to summative. Um I don't know if there is a is a good resource. If you look at the marketplace, there's a lot at level one, less at level two, and almost non-existent at level three because it is much more challenging uh, to produce content at level three uh, and very time consuming. Uh, here's the thing. I don't really know if it's necessary to have a lot of structured response questions. I think it's necessary to have a lot of practice in answering them, but I don't, I, I think once you understand how to answer them, short answers, uh, you're not teaching the greater the answer, you're telling the greater the answer, one, two bullet points, any justify, any explain, any, any support always flows like this. You said this, and it means this. That's your answer. You said this means there's some case fact you can point to. You said this, and it means this. I'm done. Thank you. I mean, once you once you get that that's what the answers look like, uh, I don't know that having more makes would is is having more questions about the same topic really matter. I think having more structured response where you can practice the way you answer. So it's not so much, I need more uh, uh, equity questions to practice structured response, where I think a proper statement is, I need more determine and support, determine and justify, explain, identify. I need more of those types of questions to practice on. Because it's, well, if you have a question that is determine and justify, that is slightly different than determine and support. Uh, so if you practice enough determine justifies and enough determine supports, what does it matter what the topic was behind the question? It is the structure of the question that you want to practice, not the content of the question. You're going to walk into the exam room with the content of the, the, content, uh, of the answer in your head. <clears throat> it's the structure of the answer because they are structured response, not essay, but structured response. So identify, how do you answer those? Uh, uh, you know, determine, justify, determine, support, determine, explain. How? What's the difference between those three and how do you answer those? If you have enough practice on the different types of questions, I don't know that the subject matter being tested is as important as the type of question. That being said, if you go through the mock exams we have, the five and then the three seminars, 
you know, some of the 90 questions of which you're going to see uh, those keywords again and again and again and again and again. And if you attend the uh, drop-in sessions we have for each one of them, the live drop-in sessions for each one, by the time you get through the eighth one, you'll be sick and tired of hearing me say the same thing again and again and again and again on each on each question. But in the exam, you'll know it. You'll 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 see determine justify. You go. I know exactly what I'm doing here. I know it's 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 two to three bullet points, and my job is to get rid of the other. Is is not only to pick the right option, but get rid of the other two. Uh, for justify. For support, I don't have to get rid of the other two. My job is to say you said this, and this is why. Here's my support. One, two bullet points. I'm done. Once you have that pattern, what does it matter, right? How long to prepare for CFA level three? Uh, that's all individually determined uh, by your lifestyle, your willingness to put in the time, uh, your uh, cognitive ability. Uh, so there is no one answer. There is an average with a standard deviation. So successful candidates report on average 300 hours per level. So there's 300 hours. And then there's a range from that 300 hours because that is the middle of a distribution. It's a random variable. And we know there are distributions around random variables that if you are better prepared for level one, if you have a lot of cognitive horsepower, you have very few obligations in your life uh, and you have absolute willingness to put in the time, uh, then it might take you three months. Uh, but if you have other obligations in your life, uh, you uh, find the content cognitively challenging. Uh, it takes you longer to learn than, than other people, but you'll still learn it the same way, but it does take you longer. It might take you seven months or eight months. Um, I can't answer that question other than with an average and averages are unsatisfying. All right. Um, so is it possible to skip the CFAI books if we diligently prepare with your videos? I mean, possible, possible. Whenever we say possible, almost anything is possible. Um, yeah, it's possible. Uh, but let's think about advisable. Uh, I don't advise it, but it's possible. Sure. Uh, and I've had many candidates over the years say that that's what they've done. I don't advise it, though, because um, in my videos, I cover everything. But I have to make judgment calls. You know, you get to a certain point, you say, OK, I get what this paragraph is trying to say. It's it's a new concept that's, you know, there's page and a half of the concept and then there's a small paragraph at the end saying there is also and it's two or three sentences and I can see that the author is not really trying to introduce it as a concept but suggest that hey listen you know this is not the only thing there are other things as well and I have to make a judgment call of well how deep do I want to go in on that because that's not a testable concept at this point uh, and there's not enough there to actually make any sense so uh, um for example, there's there's one part that talks about um, trading the basis in fixed income, and there's a pair, uh, one like five or six sentences about it at the end of a section, at the end of a chapter. I don't include that in the video because it's an afterthought. Number one, and number two, there's nowhere near enough information in that paragraph that even comes close to resembling what the true what the true thing is it's 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 a much longer detailed thing to get into but when you're reading you come across those things that i make judgment calls on i say well i'm not going to include this and i can't cover every single sentence otherwise i may as well just put on a sweater smoke a pipe sit by a fireplace and do a dramatic reading of the chapter to you if i'm going to read every every single word um when you learn from the videos and then you do a reading, you, you go to the, the words and you actually read them and you do a slow reading, other things may jump out at you that you say, oh, okay, that fills a hole from this point to this point. I get this. And it may fill in this, 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 some gaps that you may still have. So it's advisable to, to also uh, combine it with reading as well. 
Okay, where do we leave off here? Every now and then the comment section jumps all the way to the end. Also want to say thank you for doing what you do. Oh, well, okay. Failed level three, February 2023. Gave it uh, very easy. I gave it very easy comparing how I prepared and didn't have any trouble solving almost 90% problem in exam, but still didn't clear. Uh, and how to go forward. Um, well, I mean, I think you said it there. Uh, I gave, I gave is very easy comparing how I prepared. So I'm assuming that 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 is saying that you didn't, you didn't really put as much effort into it as how you usually prepare comparing how I prepared or you thought it was an easy exam based on how you prepared and you didn't make it, which means um, you, you say you answered 90% of the questions answering questions. Isn't how you is, isn't the key success factor. It's answering questions correctly. Right. So I could say I answered all the questions, but I mean, I could have just guessed at all of them, which means that, what you think you know, you do not know, which is which is probably one of the more dangerous places to be. Uh, as Mark Twain said, it's not the stuff we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's the stuff we know for sure that just ain't so. So you probably know or think you know the content at level three, but you don't. But you think you do, you have this illusion of knowledge, so you don't in your mind see a problem that needs to be solved. This is the problem uh, in, you know, dealing with some people uh, in, in real life sometimes is that they don't know enough to recognize that they're wrong. And it's almost impossible to impress upon them that they're missing some information or that they're wrong because in their mind they think about the no, 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 I'm right. No, you're missing some knowledge or your understanding is wrong. You learned it wrong. You don't really know it. This is the way it is. So you probably think you know it, but you don't. Or you know it the wrong way and you have this sense of completion, this illusion of knowledge about it, which which just isn't so. Uh, so I don't have nearly enough information to, to, to say uh, uh, how you should go forward because I don't know how you got to where you are. I don't know what you did. Level three access expired. How could I access the paid direct guidance counseling from CFA charter holders if I'd want to get guidance or have someone to talk to? Uh, you can... Uh, you can take a, a, a session. I don't think you need to be a subscriber. Or is there a, a leak there where you need to be a subscriber? I think if you have the archive, which you do, you should be able to add. You should be able to add sessions. Oh, that's interesting now. I don't know if that's true. Hmm. That would be. I think a question to send into the support team is to say, hey, uh, there's a bit of a catch-22 here, is that I would like to have some of these sessions. Uh, I did subscribe. I didn't pass that exam. I haven't rescheduled yet. Can I get some of these sessions to help me figure out when I want to? I think is that's a valid question if if the system's disallowing you from adding on those sessions, then yeah, that is a valid, that's a valid point. Um, but it's nothing that I can solve on my end, but I certainly would bring it up with someone on the support side. Please explain to us how the IG and high yield index OAS are constructed. Do they use callable bonds or puttable bonds? Well, if you have uh, a high yield index, you're going to have callable bonds. Right, and probably some puttable bonds, less so on the investment grade, but OAS is option adjusted spread, which, yeah, they adjust for the options. Um, but I don't understand what you mean by 
how the uh, indexes uh, are constructed. An index is, is just a listing of bonds is saying, well, you know, for investment grade index, there could be a thousand corporate bonds in there uh, to start getting into how they're constructed. Well, first of all, OASs are not constructed. They're calculated. Uh, they're, they're just, they're just calculated. CFA portal questions have long answers for structured response. No, 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 that is misleading, right? So the answer that you get um, for those structured responses is what's called a model answer. That does not mean that your answer should look like that. That answer is for the grader. So the grader reads that answer and says, okay, I know what I'm looking for now. And then looks at your answer and says, okay, are you saying the same thing with different words, which you will be saying the same thing with different words. The many words in the model answer are not meant to be the answer you would provide. They're meant to provide the grader with enough information that they can recognize whatever answer you give. So they'll tend to be wordy and long because they're meant to help the grader understand the parameters in which the answer must, must fit or the possibilities that they could find in a particular answer, but in no way reflect what an answer should look like. That's misleading. So uh, that's something they, I think they, they, they should be able to clear up or they should clear up. I work in ESG. I might become passionate about fundamental analysis and portfolio management through your materials. Do you have any career advice? Hmm. Um, well, uh, ESG, you're, you're still evaluating something, right? Uh, uh, you're, you're evaluating companies on particular criteria. Fundamental analysis is the same thing. You're evaluating companies, except you're evaluating them on, on, on less qualitative and more quantitative criteria, more fundamental criteria. Uh, I think, I think an analysis skill, if you are good at analyzing this, you should be good at analyzing something else, I think. Uh, as far as career advice, um, I am far removed from the job market, so I'm, I'm not sure what career paths look like, uh, especially when we start talking about multiple, multiple countries uh, in a world that is different than the world i i grew up in i don't know what uh I, I i don't know what good advice there would look like uh i would say what is good advice all the time is speak up uh let your uh let your desires and your goals be known in the organization so that those above you or those responsible for the development of your your human capital can begin to guide you in in the right way uh, or let you know that this is not where it's going to happen for you, right? Um, all right, so somebody saying thank you. They passed their exams. What statistical program do you use mostly for data analysis? I'm currently learning R and Stata. Yeah, those are good. Um, historically, uh, what did I learn on? SPSS. Uh, Excel can pretty much do everything I need to do, you know, unless I'm doing some very heavy, very heavy uh, research uh, for the most part, for most financial applications, Excel can, can do what you need to do. Uh, but R, you're good with R. How much before the exam should I target to finish the material and reading? At level three, at least 35 days before the exam for CFII mock exams, any chance you could or are willing to make some solution videos in the future? I couldn't do it without permission. Uh, and I don't know if I would get permission. It's not included in the materials under which we do get a copyright. Uh, so I couldn't do it. I believe that CFAI doesn't write that exam. I think it's written by, one of the CFA societies, they would 
they would have to grant me something uh, to get it done. I don't know if 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 they would or wouldn't. Um, so I can't just. I cannot just pick and choose what I want to do, right? I can't just say, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. I, I've got to be very careful uh, because I'll be using somebody else's content in the video. Now, if that is then given to them, I don't think they'd have a problem with that. But if it's being used and it's behind a paywall, I think that'd be, you know, uh, I can't just, you know, I'm not free to do what I want when other people own copyrights. Do you really think still they are hiring CFAs in the current condition? Um, sure. Oh, I, I, I don't, I don't know why they wouldn't. I, I, I don't know if that's the right question. Are they still hiring CFAs? I don't know that that is the right question to ask. Um, our firms, our financial firms, net, uh, uh, um, do they represent net additions to employment uh, or net subtractions to employment? Is the industry uh, growing or is the industry shrinking? First of all, you have to ask that question. If you conclude that, well, the industry is still adding net employment, uh, then... The question is not, are they hiring CFAs? The question is, does the CFA charter in your particular market offer a competitive advantage uh, in a pile of resumes by getting you in the room? Uh, the letters at the end of your name that you collect through your life, those aren't entitlements. They don't entitle you to a damn thing. They don't entitle you to a job just because you have them to say, well, I've got these three letters. I can't get a job. Maybe it's you, right? Uh, those three letters are attached to the end of your name. Those are competitive advantages. Uh, but if you are such an undesirable person to begin with, lipstick on a pig, man. I mean, what can you do? Um, it should get you in the room or it should increase the probability of you getting in a room. But you have to show up in that room. You have to get that job. Uh, so if, if, you're not getting in a room, there's something wrong with your resume. If you're getting in a room and not getting a job, there's something wrong with you. So I don't know if I can answer the question, are people still hiring CFAs? It is, are people still hiring? And if they are, does the CFA give you competitive advantage? And if it does, then we can say, if you're not getting in the room, your resume is at fault. If you're getting in the room, there's something wrong with you if you're still not getting any offers. Uh, I'm starting my preparation for level three now. After a break of two years, will you be able to guide me on how I should prepare? And also, do I need to revise my level one and level two? Well, I, I for revising, I always say do it opportunistically. Um, that means that just jump into level three. And as you feel you need review, do it then. But don't do a whole bunch of review in anticipation that you would have to do the review for level three without knowing whether or not you really needed to do the review to begin with. Uh, so just do it opportunistically. Having a hard time managing my work and studying. Can you provide some insights on how I should go ahead with preparation for level one in February? No, this is more for level three, not level one, but let's assume you said level three because I'm sure other people have a hard time balancing work uh, and study. But by level three, you would have figured it out. You would have figured out that that you need better balance, that you can't just race to the next exam uh, because other obligations in your life. Um, well, you know, you've still got a lot of time. You finish quantitative methods, but there's you know, only one section, but still a lot of time. Uh, but if you... If you, if you have work and you are studying, you're going to have to give yourself more time because these are big levels. All three of them are big levels. Uh, sometimes we, we think that we can uh, do more than we actually can. We, 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 
we think, well, I can do this, well, I, but I can do that and I can do this and without looking at the total amount of time that you have and the total amount of things that you want to do. So what I would do is I would start with your schedule and put all the things in your schedule that you have no choice about work, family, personal life, uh, things like that. Look how much time you have left over. Uh, it is surprising to some people how much just life takes out of their week. Um, and then whatever time you have left, if it's not enough time, then you have to start playing the sacrifice game is what are you willing to sacrifice uh, to get this done? Uh, your sacrifice might be, okay, well, the sacrifice I'll make is rather than getting it done in three years, I'll get it done over five years. I'll just take longer. If you want to get it done in three years and you don't have the time, something has to go. Usually it'll be something in your personal life, not your professional life. Something something has to go. So look at where you are now to February and ask yourself what, it, you know, maybe maybe make a list of priorities in your life about what's important, where you want to spend your time, how much time you have to spend. And if you have the time, just not the discipline, well, then again, refer to your list of priorities. What's your priority? Is it keeping up on all the latest episodes that Apple TV and Amazon put out there because I don't want to miss my shows? Uh, or is it building a, a, a rewarding career, right? Figure out what your priorities are. And if you still don't have the time, then you're going to have to play the sacrifice game. Uh, and you're going to have to figure out what you sacrifice, what goes and what stays. Well, I work as a credit analyst at a commercial bank. How to stay in touch with the curriculum without being actively involved in the markets? Um. Okay, so I don't know what perspective you're asking that from. If you're asking it from the perspective of a candidate, well, you are um, in touch with the curriculum um, without being actively involved in markets. In that sense, you are actively uh, uh, involved in the curriculum. Um, if you have completed all three levels and you work as a credit analyst and you want to and you want to stay uh, in touch. As of November 30th, we will have our charter holder subscription, which will include uh, all the archives, level one, two, three archives, one year delayed, but updated each year so that you always have uh, the newest readings. Uh, parts of the applied series, I don't know if it's all the applied series, but parts of the applied series and um, CFA produces monographs each year you know, 100 pages, 150 pages that are worth four or six hours of continuing education uh, that you can read. I'll do, I'll be doing videos around those so that you can then uh, get your 20 hours of continuing education credit uh, by following CFA research uh, that is uh, put out, the new monographs they put out from time to time uh, in a more digestible way if you don't like the, 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 the reading because it can get a little bit heavy at times and it lacks... I think the excitement of, of having it narrated by bringing in a whole bunch of, you know, like, here's a good example of this. Here's an example of that. Just wrote L3 in August and I'm not so confident, but who knows? What do I do till results day? Well, I think we're what, three weeks away from results day, four weeks away. You're not that well. Here's the thing. Um, uh, reviewing a section, taking, let's say, the fixed income section and going through it nice and slow, a nice, careful reading line by line over the next couple of weeks has no downside. Because if you pass, uh, you will understand immunization, yield curve strategies, credit strategies a lot more. Uh, if you don't, you're that much further ahead. There is no downside to learning something more. Um, even you know, I do this from time to time. I'll watch a video on YouTube from some university uh, that puts something out uh, on, let's say, a particular industry where they have a guest speaker uh, in and the guest speaker is talking about this particular industry or that particular industry. Pick one and I'll watch it. And sometimes, you know, for the whole hour, it's interesting as, he, as the person's talking. I'm thinking, OK, well. I know all of this. Yeah, I'm not learning anything new. But then they'll say one sentence in particular, one little, give one little example where it's like, 
oh, that's interesting. And it gives me this insight I didn't have before, that another little piece that is not part of the puzzle that I'm missing, but it's a piece on the end making my picture bigger. It's like, okay. So for me, that extra hour of a lot of review stuff I heard before, but one incremental new thing was more than worth it, was more than worth it. So, uh, you know, it's the same thing with with doing this, is that that even, even reviewing this, if you passed, you think, oh, well, I wasted my time. No, because you, even if you pull one or two other things out of it that you didn't have before, um, there is no downside to doing that, none. Uh, level three materials put out by CFAA are of highly variable quality. Some readings are squeaky clean. Others are riddled with errors. Yes, you're right. And um, one reading is almost cut and paste from another source with almost no attribution. So if you look at the credit curve, uh, the credit strategies reading, and you look at all the credit spread measures uh, there, that is lifted, almost cut and pasted word for word from another source of which I provide the source uh, in the uh, uh, in the video. I, I tell you the source of it, and you can go right to the original source, and it's a better source. Uh, so yeah, there are some credit, there are some quality issues uh, with the work with the work at level three. I will agree with that. Um, I don't know if that question continues on. I'm I'm looking down to see if. This person had something else, but it just ended up further down the list, but I don't see anything. So we'll just say, yeah, uh, you're right. There is questionable questionable content, a lot of mistakes, sometimes very fundamental mistakes such that, no, it, that's completely wrong. That's not how that happens at all. Uh, so how to deal with the burnout while studying for level three? I was used to being able to set three hours straight in one and two, but with level three, I can't keep up with 30 minute sessions. <laughs> um, maybe you just need, maybe you just need a break. Uh, maybe you just need to refine your passion. Um, burnout happens. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, um, for the first couple of years, you have momentum, then it's, it starts to weigh on you because it's just you 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 um, just get bored of all these academic papers. Like to read another one, you think I'm going to puke if I got to read another academic paper. I'm I'm, I'm sick of these. Um, to the very end, where you know it took everything in you to even to even look at a paper. Uh, once I finished. I think it was years before I could even look at an academic paper and read it. Just, just even looking at them made me sick because I was so burnt out. I just didn't want to have anything to do with them. Now, now I'm okay. <laughs> years later, I'm okay. But I, I know, I know that feeling of burnout. I get it too. Uh, if I'm working on uh, something that I have to research, uh, any particular industry, if I'm going to do a video on an industry, I first must research the industry. And uh, how research works is you always over-research and then you consolidate. So you'll research something, you'll think you'll have it, triple it. You over-research and then it shrinks. And, and you find out that probably 50% of what you research is, no, is, is not needed for what you want to do. Um, you do get burnt out. Sometimes, uh, you know, there were times where I could go four or five hours on one topic. Now it's like you know, an hour and a half, two hours in, it's okay. I'm, I don't want to read another word. I, I got to do something else. So try this. Do distributed learning. I mean, you get sick after 30 minutes, switch to a different topic. So don't just do all fixed income, then all equity, then all capital market expectations. Have three topics going at any given time. Spend half an hour on fixed income. Say, okay, well, I'm, 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 I'm tired of this. Jump over to equity uh, or jump over to, uh, uh, you know, the reading on hedge funds or alternative investments or over to behavioral finance. Jump around. It's okay to jump around. Uh, that might, a new topic might keep you going. 
2018, I met your free pet material on MM. At level one, level two content, there is extensive. Uh, my assumption was the 218 readings can still be relevant. Uh, not for level one. No, not for level one. The 2018 uh, is not going to be uh, enough. I think there's been enough change. Um, now, there's enough that's still common. There's still a fairly large overlap. Uh, but no, I, I, I would not rely on it to prepare for 23, 24. Uh, no, I would not especially for corporate finance, uh, quant. The fixed income still got a big overlap. Derivatives, fairly decent overlap. Not for alternative investments, though. That's that's fairly new. Portfolio management, sure. Ethics, sure. Uh, equity section, for the most part, sure. Uh, FSA, 80%. Uh, standards change all the time. So uh, what was a standard in 2018 may be a different standard today, or there may be a different test for impairment today than there was in 2018 because, because uh, they, they do change. Uh, GAP does, over time, uh, attempt to do things that gets closer to IFRS. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely be using the current, the current content. Is there uh, a seminar video on how to answer the essay questions? Oh, my God. Yeah, level three. I've got a whole bunch. There's a whole folder uh, with uh, three videos in there. Uh, there is a uh, video for every single answer on the mock exam. There's a video. Uh, I do uh, live uh, sessions, drop-in sessions for each of the exams. I do two of them to try to appeal to different uh, uh, times time zones. I don't know if there's another provider that provides more level three structured response support than we do. Um, if there is, tell me what they're doing, because I think we've gone way beyond uh, uh, whatever benchmark there is for that in terms of the of the support we provide. Uh, all part of your level three subscription. There's no extra. Once you're, you have a subscription for level three, all of those sessions you can attend uh, the office hour session, the extra seminars, the the the, the structured response seminars, the drop-in sessions, the the overkill on the mock exams we have to the point we have like eight full mock exams, something like ninety structured response questions. Um, again, all with video walkthroughs, all with me doing live walkthroughs uh, of them as well. So I don't know what more we could throw in there. Uh, let's see. Let's scroll up here. Four hundred hours for level three. Haven't started. Sitting in February. <laughs> possible to pass given full time work. Anything is possible. Uh, let's move away from words like possible, and and start putting things like conditional, conditionally probable. Everything is possible. Uh, that's not that's not what we're interested in. Is it possible for me to win the lottery? Yes, it is. If you have a ticket, it is possible to win the lottery. It's just not very probable. Uh, so is it possible uh, for me to squat 400 pounds, being that I've never in my life squatted 400? Yeah, it's possible, but it's not probable. Uh, so you'd have to put in a conditional probability. Well, it's it's probable conditioned on this, that you train in this way for this long and do all of these things, that everything has a conditional probability. So you have to ask yourself, not as if, it, if it's possible. Don't ask me if it's possible. Ask yourself if it's probable conditioned on, well, what are the conditions? You know, conditioned on, I'm going to put in one hour a week for nine weeks. No then I would say you'd be assigning an extremely low probability to that. How do you get the probability higher? You change your conditions. Uh, once you start thinking about outcomes in terms of conditional probabilities, you are in full control of your conditions. So that means that you are not subject to the whims of the universe. You are, you are the creator of your own universe. Understand what your conditionals are that dictate your probability and change your conditions. You know, if, if, 
is it possible you want to put in 400 hours you haven't started now well you know you've got 20 weeks let's say take off five weeks for review you've got 15 weeks 400 hours you're talking about 33 hours per week that's a pretty high conditional you know is that a conditional that you can live with you got a job you're probably putting in from the time you leave your home to the time you get back your commute time and the hours you put in maybe 10 hours a day disappear uh, uh, so 50 hours a week there and you want to put in another 35 hours a week on this you're at 85 hours you're gonna sleep 56 hours it's not a lot of time left for life and the administration of life because of course you got to eat, you got to go to the bathroom, you got to shower, you got all of that takes time. So your conditionals are where you'll determine whether or not you have the probability to get it done. Figure out what your conditionals are to get to 90% probability, let's say, and then think about can you actually live up to those conditionals? If you can't, then that probability is somewhat lower, right? What is the minimum percentage to target in EOC, CFA, MOX, MM, MOX to pass a level three? Well, minimum, I think, if you're 60%, 65% or higher. Yeah, I think I think you're on the right pathway. Obviously, the higher, the better. I don't like this minimum business, but if I had to, if I had to put a number on it, I'd probably say somewhere around there. Any recommendations on what to do after having passed having passed CFA and finished your other courses. I love learning, but the need to structure. Uh, the applied series uh, is probably a good place to be. Um, the sector studies, I think, is going to be the biggest part of the applied series. Um, so what I'm doing in there is there are 11 sectors to the economy. I'm making a video on each of the 11 sectors. I've got six done now, energy I'm working on now. Um, but after that, it's the industries and the sub-industries. So every sector has industries and sub-industries. And I want to get a, a, a good video done, you know, hour and a half, two, two and a half hours on each of the particular industries. Uh, so that if you need to analyze a stock, it's difficult to do unless you first understand the industry. So you can watch, you know, you can learn from these videos very quickly something that takes me two weeks of, of, of research to get done. Uh, now that's two weeks of, like I say, you research and you over research and then you bring it down. Uh, that's ongoing. That uh, There's no, there's no end date on that. You got one hundred and 136 industries out there. It takes me two to three weeks to, to do a really good one. Uh, so that just, that just keeps going. Uh, but there's a good place to be. If I purchase portfolio construction course and want to have all the applied series, it will be deducted from the total price. Yes, it will. When will the supplied market series expire once purchased? It doesn't. What's the main reason you think that CFA two candidates who have submitted a very hard exam fail level three? Main reason, uh, as I've said earlier, is that you fail to recognize that level three moves up in those levels of learning. That it is, it's it's not just simply understanding an application, it's evaluation and analysis. So you you move up a level. So a level two question would be: uh, Here's three years of uh, forecasts. Calculate uh, the end of the second year residual income. Well, that's easy to get to, right? It's calculate. It can be calculated. Uh, you entered a derivative three months ago. Here are the conditions today. What's the value of the derivative? Well, that's just time value of money. That's easy to do. Uh, so let's just change those to level three questions. Here are three years of uh, statements. Uh, determine uh, this is what's going to happen. Uh, this event is going to happen. Determine the most appropriate uh, uh, valuation method uh, to use at the end of year two. Well, you first have to analyze what the conditions happen to be, right? Is it 
uh, somebody buying a minority interest, somebody buying a majority interest? Is it uh, an abandonment of a project? Is it, you know, I got to give you some conditions. You must analyze those conditions and then you must evaluate which of the three or four options you have and what to choose and then justify why. In other words, don't calculate anything. Pick pick one of these three things and uh, justify why you pick that one versus the other one. Now, the other ones will have things in their favor as well, but one will have more things in their favor. That brings it to a level three question. Uh, for the derivative one, rather than saying what's the value of the derivative, I say you entered a derivative three months ago. The yield curve did this. Your expectation is for this to do that. Uh, and you are following uh, uh, hedge accounting for this one. Um, or, or you're not following hedge accounting. That makes it more interesting. You're not following hedge accounting. Uh, what should you do? Should you close your hedge, uh, reduce your hedge, leave it the same, or increase your hedge and support your answer? Well, now you got to analyze what's about to happen, what has happened. Are you in gains? Are you in losses? What do you expect to have? So that brings it to a level three where it's not just, okay, I need these four variables. Here's my formula. Here's my answer. There is no formulaic answer for this, right? There's no formula. You have to move to those higher levels of evaluation and analysis. And if you don't, if you try to study for level three the same way you did for level two, you're probably not going to do that well. Uh, do you think they still are hiring CFAs? I already answered that. Uh, do you need to read the CFAI text or is pooling your notes uh, with the white text and blue box examples and textbooks a good approach? Yeah, I, uh, I want you to change your words, though. Uh, do you need to read? You don't need to do anything, okay? This is, this is your life. You don't need to do anything. Uh, you get to do it. You don't need to do it. So if you think, do I need to clean my room today or do I get to clean my room today? Notice the two different approaches. One of them, I want to get to it. The other one is like, I really don't want to do it. So if there's something where you're using the word need, do I need to show up at work at nine or can it be 9.15? Do I need to stay right till five? Here's somebody that 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 doesn't get meaning from work. Here's somebody who who sees this as a means to an end and probably the end is the paycheck, but it's certainly not a career. Uh, because with a career, you'd be saying, can I get the keys so I can get in at 5.30? You guys don't get here till 6.30. There's the difference, right? Do you get to do it or do you need to do it? Do I need to read the CFA text? No, you don't need to. But I highly recommend it because for me, I would feel that I'm missing some of the richness of the journey, Right? Like I said earlier, sometimes I watch a video where, okay, well, I know all this stuff, but there's one sentence or, or one statement that, that incrementally adds something I didn't have. Um, well, that was worth it. So you can watch the latest episode of Big Brother or you can read. It's your choice. You don't have to do it. You get to choose what you want to do, but you are. At any point in time, the sum total of all the choices that you've made, which choices are you going to make? All right. Greetings from Berlin. Oh, look at that. Berlin's on. Uh, why don't you add, again, comments for only candidates to answer them? We have thought about that, but they need to be moderated. Because what if you get an answer and you think, oh, okay, thank you. And it's wrong. And other people read that answer and it's wrong. It's the wrong answer. We risk you going into the exam and answering the question wrong. So that's a big risk. That's a risk that we have the ability to correct, but it requires moderation. And if the answer is wrong, uh, it takes just as much time to read the answer read the question, read the answer, fact check the answer, then re-answer as it would to answer six or seven questions on our own. It actually is, is, is more time consuming. So it's the risk of getting it wrong and there's not enough interaction in the comments section to create a forum. For a forum, you need huge, uh, uh, huge markets. So Reddit with 90,000, 100,000 uh, in the CFA subreddit, is dynamic and big enough to create a forum. You can't create a forum 
Uh, if in a video there's only eight people engaging in the comment section, that's not going to be a forum. That's why analyst forum is failing uh, and pretty much uh, almost out of business these days is because they don't have the critical mass to create a forum. Uh, it is just, you know, sort of a waste of time. When you ask a question, you see two answers over the last six months. That's not a forum. You need that dynamic interchange that happens over the next 24 hours where you get uh, uh, 12 or 13 people answering, each one perfecting on the next person's answer. That's the power of a forum. Um, we would have to have a lot more engagement to create that kind of forum. But again, 40% of our users never ask a single question. They're not engaged. Um, many, many only ask one or two across the whole platform. It is a small group that asks the most, that ask almost all the questions. That's not enough for a forum. So it would fail on that point and it would need to be moderated, right? This is, these are, if you're ever going to build any kind of social media platform where you expect user generated uh, content, you need, you need to scale fast. You need lots of eyeballs really fast. Otherwise you're not gonna get that critical mass you need to create that. Reddit has it. And because Reddit has it, we would be recreating a solution in, within our own site. Meanwhile, Reddit has it already. Uh, uh, and because they have it, if we send you there, they have one more. And if we send another one there, they have yet another one. And if we send another one, they have yet another one. So you have that critical mass that makes it a much better mechanism to, to, to create that kind of outcome, that user-generated outcome, than we could by trying to keep it just with users only because you need big markets to get that done. Well, if we have 20% of a market and only 10% engage, that's not the same as having 10% of 100%. Not only that, Reddit has charter holders. Well, we don't have that. We, don't, we lack that. Reddit has practitioners. Well, we only have those that are, that are preparing for the exam. It's a far better place to be in the crowd. So... Where did I leave off here? There it is. Uh, but here's what I would suggest on our site. The comment section is open for your own personal comments. Put them there. Ask all your questions. Ask all your questions. I get it. Nobody can see it but you. But ask all your questions. As, as you're going through the video, you know what's going to happen? You'll answer some of your own questions and you can delete them. And then when we get to the office hours, you already have a list of all your questions. You already have a list of all your questions, and then you could just ask them in the office hours and get them all out of the way, all right? So if Canada answers uh, other candidates, he should get store credit. Who's, who's going to fact check that, right? So um, let's say that we did that. Uh, you, you, you are going to get some people who will then game the system. They will put an answer down, any answer, whether it's right or wrong, just to say I answered it. So you now need an algorithm that can judge whether or not that answer was correct. That doesn't exist, which means you need a human. Uh, and it is more time consuming for the human to fact check the answer than it would be just to answer it themselves. There is no inexpensive way to get this done. We have tried that before. Uh, and, and it ends up being a whole lot of work and, and a lot more time. It sounds nice. But you, you, you don't want the blind leading the blind. That's a big problem. On Reddit, the blind can attempt to lead the blind, but lots of people with vision will step in as well. How many times have you read a Reddit chain where somebody asks a question, somebody answers it, and a couple answers down, somebody else says, no, 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 it's actually this, and then it gets upvoted to the top, right? You need that kind of environment. Uh, how many decimal places do we set for our calculators? I set mine at nine. I, I preserve every decimal place. I set it at nine. The exam will tell you how many decimal places uh, to answer. If there, if if it if it is an issue, it'll tell you how many decimal places to round off to. Uh, what is your IQ? I don't know what it is today. Last measured was pre uh, pre PhD. 
you do a whole bunch of these psychometric tests, uh, Myers Briggs, there's a whole bunch of other ones, depending on the test, uh, 136 to 143, it's a tight range depending on the test, but that changes over your life, right? You, it, the more you learn, the better you become at learning it, you can improve your intelligence quotient. Uh, your intelligence measures the speed at which you can learn new information. It doesn't measure how much facts you have in your head. Okay, so it's not a trivia exam in the least. Uh, uh, so it, it just measures how quickly you, you learn new, new material uh, or learn new concepts or learn new things or how quickly you can make connections uh, between things. Um, so it's, it's a tight range, 136 to 143. I underestimated CFA3. I think I'm going to pay for it. Okay. When you calculate money-weighted returns, one should take IRR. Well, IRR is a money-weighted return. It's not that one should take IRR. It's the IRR is a money-weighted re return. With money going in and out, you get different sign changes. Normally, IRR doesn't work good with that. How to avoid this? Um... You do well. Um, you can avoid it by using by using a modified method. So what you would do is you would calculate uh, rather than having all your whole time series where you have in out in out in out in out in out is you would break it down into periods in which in you know uh, you had money in up to this point, then money came out. Then you calculate another IRR till there's another significant cash flow. Then another IRR till another one, and then you chain them together. You have one plus IRR multiplied by one plus IRR multiplied by one plus IRR over all those holding periods, and then you you would chain chain the IRRs together, and you would calculate an IRR on the date of any significant cash flow, significant you'd have to define for yourself what significant is, but then you would calculate an IRR each time there's a significant cash flow. I believe you should be able to find that in the GIPS section at level three under the, I think, in the modified DEETS approach. 300 Hours website has been forecasting an increasing trend of the MPS. Do you think the quality... The candidates are becoming more competent or CFA wants to maintain the passing rate at a lower level. Well, a couple of things in there. See, 300 hours has been forecasting an increase. Who are they? They're not They're not CFAI. They've been forecasting an increase, but who are they? Uh, and on what basis are they forecasting an increase? What is the methodology of, 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 the, uh, uh, of the whatever forecasting tool that they use to arrive at that? Uh, um, it, you know, so I, I would... I would first of all say, well, that's just somebody's forecast. I can't infer intentionality on the part of CFAI just because somebody has a forecast that says something is going up, right? If, if I have a forecast that GDP is increasing, you would not then show up at the White House press briefing and say, uh, how does your administration justify this? Uh, um, you know, like, that's my forecast. It's not there. So if CFAI had the forecast, then I'd say there's something there. We can attribute some intentionality. But when a arm's length third party has a forecast about something uh, to then attribute intentionality on the part of CFAI to meet the forecast of a third party doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Uh, you mentioned all this. All of this is a career, and it's about passion and curiosity. Do I even need a job and some fun to get sufficient experience, or can I attempt to do all myself in my free time? You can get experience in 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 your free time. Uh, this is this is this is not a uh, you know a club that you need you need entrance into to learn the secrets. There are some things you're not going to get experience with unless you're uh, unless you're in the industry because you're simply not going to have the equipment or the resources uh, to get that type to get that type of experience. But markets are available to everybody. Economic data is available to everybody. Uh, SEC information is available to everybody. 
there are plenty of places to publish your own your own private research that you've done from creating your own subsac to creating alpha to what's the other one that's out there uh not creating alpha uh, seeking alpha there's there's a couple sites like that that pay uh based on on users um a substack you have your own your own subscribers that you give them some free stuff and you have some paid stuff you have you can have a youtube channel you can use linkedin lots of people use linkedin for uh, uh, putting out uh, little snippets of their own research. Uh, you can create, you can open up uh, any brokerage account and most of them do have the option for paper portfolios that you can run a paper portfolio uh, as well. There's no limitation uh, and no shortage of ability to demonstrate that you know what you're doing outside of what an organization can do. Now, if you're good at that, any organization will say, look, we bring a whole bunch of information and access that you don't have right now and you're already this good right so there's there's lots of ways to prove uh that you're good at this or that that you could be good at this uh advice for someone transitioning from sales to portfolio management i studied mass communications and i have no finance background but i want to pursue the cfa to advance my career um mass communications what is that like getting on your roof and yelling at your at the whole neighborhood <laughs> mass communication i yell at everyone um it, it, having no finance background is not a limitation for cfa number one uh new language uh new words new concepts but if 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 you already have a university degree in something what you have is some uh trivia about some industry but what you've gained is the ability to learn. That's what university gives you more than anything else is, is how you would learn something. The ability to learn, what you learn is irrelevant. Uh, it's only relevant to the extent that that's what you wanna do, but it's irrelevant to the process of learning how to learn. So you can learn CFA content, that, that's, that's not an issue. Um, getting from sales to portfolio management I think on a ladder, you've got a few rungs missing. That's a big jump on the ladder uh, to go from sales to managing a portfolio of assets that represent other people's wealth. That's a big step. Um, I would seem to think that you'd want to go from sales to analysis first. Uh, and then from analysis, maybe, uh, uh, maybe, move into a junior position as an you know in portfolio management and slowly uh, get to a, a more senior position but it's not an entry level job uh in the least uh so it's there is a road that has stops along the way or you can think of it as a ladder with rungs on the way but uh, it's it, it's you have a few rungs that are missing and i would say if it's something that you want to do Step out on the road, start with the CFA process, see where it gets you, you know, just start on the road, see where it goes. How would you construct a multi-asset portfolio to optimize risk-adjusted returns considering current geopolitical and oh, is that all? Is that all? 7.3% in hedge fund, 9.74%. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I would have to think deeply about that. I think how I would construct it is 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 from a decomposition, not a composition perspective. In other words, I wouldn't start with all the asset classes I would like to include uh, and then build up. I would start with a 60-40 portfolio and then deviate. So I'd start there and say, okay, there's my benchmark, 60-40. Now I'd look at my uh, uh, equity bond and I'd say from a macro perspective, Maybe I should be 55, 45. Maybe duration, uh, it'll be more interesting in the next two years than beta. I don't know. Uh, but from there, uh, from a top-down perspective, maybe I'll go 55 uh, equities, uh, uh, 45 bonds. And my equities, I might think, well, okay, uh, large cap or small cap. Uh, I think large cap can handle uh, interest rate increases better and can handle a, a contraction better. So I might underweight small cap, overweight large. I would start that way as opposed to an MVO because an MVO is built on a pile of assumptions and, and best guesses. 
for an MVO, I go, okay, well, what's my expected return for this asset class, this asset class, this asset class, expected volatilities, expected correlations. Okay, great. Now that I've made all that shit up from the top of my head, let me get a very scientific outcome. Well, why not just start with a 60-40 and strategically deviate from it until you feel that you've gotten to an allocation that considers where you think that you're going? I think that's a better way. If, if my MVO is based on a mountain of assumptions anyways, what does it matter if it's 10.6 in equities or 10.8 or 11.2? What does it matter? It's all based on a big pile of guesses anyways, right? So I'd start from a decomposition as opposed to uh, a buildup. But again, I would have to sit and think deeply about it for some time to determine what it is I want to do. But I think... One thing I can say is where we are and where over the next two years, I'd certainly have an overweight position in duration. That does not mean it's going to pay off tomorrow. That doesn't mean when the market opens, duration is going to pay off. But over the next two years, I think duration will outperform beta. That's that's basically what that means. Okay, where would I leave off here? Uh, there we go. Uh, as a CFA third-party provider, uh, do you have a teaching course by CFAI? No, they they don't do that. How do you properly prepare? Do you take any content update seminars from CFA or is it just you know how? Uh, so CFAI vets everyone. Uh, there are people who would like to do this that CFAI says, but you don't, you're not qualified. You don't have what it takes to get this done. Uh, you have to demonstrate that you have the ability to do this. You have to demonstrate that you have created unique content. So it can't just be you with their reading on the screen, reading it and adding nothing more than just reading a book to somebody. Um, it can't be that. Uh, you have to have uh, some sort of gravitas, whether it's signified by uh, being a holder of a PhD, uh, significant industry experience, uh, or uh, having the uh, three letters, the CFA. Uh, it must be something along those lines that demonstrates that you have the ability. Uh, that's that's part one. Part two is demonstrating that you actually, in fact, know what you're doing. So there are times where even people who have those qualifications have shown themselves incapable of actually assimilating that information and teaching it well. Um, usually, though, the market is the best, is the best measuring tool. So if somebody uh, or a company has a significant market share or a growing market share, it's usually for a reason. There's usually some reason behind that. Uh, now, I know that they do pull some candidates. There are these examples where they ask, you know, did you use a provider? Who did you use? This, that. They have that information. They have profiles on candidates and they have passing rates on candidates. I'm sure that internally somewhere they know they know something about how effective each of the providers are uh, so that if they are granting year to year your ability to do this, they must have some um, level of confidence in who you are and what you do. Uh, and that has been changing a lot. And if you go back like three or four years, it, I think, was an attempt at being a revenue, a revenue center because there was some 130, 140, uh, you know, approved prep providers. Well, they don't use that name uh, any longer. And they have been actively working to get that list down. So they don't see it so much as a revenue center on itself. Uh, but as as a needed extension for what they do because they don't teach, right? And they never will teach. They provide, they are uh, uh, the keepers of the knowledge. They provide a body uh, of content that you should know and the um, assessment 
of your skill level to that, but they won't teach. Uh, so no, there's there's no teaching or training courses provided, uh, but there is a rising bar, let's call it a rising bar uh, to uh, uh, to be able to do this. Now, here's the deal. You don't have to go through CFAI at all. Um, I don't have to every year pay fees to CFAI, get the content and be in the family. This is basically what we are. We're in the family. We are partners in 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 whatever it is that we do although they don't use the word partners we are pre providers for cfa content we can't use the word approved by but we do have some ability to recognize ourselves as having a gentle nod of okay we like you guys i don't have to i don't have to do anything at all and in fact as long as i don't use anything from their reading so if there's an exhibit, as long as I don't cut and paste their exhibit and put it in my video, I redraw it from scratch or I do something else, as long as I'm not putting their content in, I can get the books. I can, you know, for 2024 when they come out, I can buy the books. Uh, they sell them on Amazon. I can buy them and I can produce whatever content I want. Um, so it's... It's, I don't need them, but there is some validation in the market by being part of the family. That within the family, they're saying, you know, you, you're doing good. We agree with you. We have no issue with you. Here you go. It signals to the marketplace that, that, that they're okay, right? Which L2 topics do you think we should revise before uh, starting L3 studies? L2. Um, I think the, I think I go to L1 uh, and review all the concepts behind fixed income duration. Make sure you got that down cold because you're just expected to know it at level three. And I find that many candidates at level three, based on questions they ask, uh, a lot of it centers around duration is, is a misunderstanding of what duration actually is or a lack of understanding of what duration is. Uh, I'd say that one is probably critical. Um, level one portfolio management, at least the two readings on risk and uh, on, on the uh, risk return concepts uh, for portfolio management, I think are important. And the reading at level two on active management, uh, uh, the returns on active management, uh, I think, uh, are, are, I'd say those are the three, are, are the big ones that I would pay attention to. There are others, but those are the big ones that I would pay attention to. If I had to pick one topic, one topic only, it would be duration from level one. Um, any way you have found out that one can increase or boost the cognitive horsepower that you mentioned, or is it all genetics? No, it's not all genetics. Uh, you, the more you learn, not, not the more stuff, you know, that's, that's a different thing. That's just trivia, right? The more you learn, uh, the easier it becomes to learn new things. You actually can increase your learning, uh, your learning ability. When you learn new things, what happens is, uh, the neurons in your brain, uh, start reaching out to make new connections. So let's say that I ask you something you don't know the answer to, or you're reading something you don't quite understand. You don't have mental pathways for that. So neurons aren't firing along certain mental pathways that you've already established because this is all brand new. So it doesn't, it, there are no connections made yet. Every time you learn something new, there's a new connection that's made somewhere. So the density of these connections increases. So you can have a bunch of neurons in your brain with all these long dendrites, which are the long tail out of these neurons that all just hang around and not connected to anything. You're basically brain dead because every time one neuron fires, it goes nowhere, right? So they have to be connected to other neurons along the way. And it's these long little dendrites that attempt to reach out and ah, they make a connection You've just, you've just increased the cognitive capacity of your brain every time you make that connection. But while these things are moving around in your brain, attempting to make new connections, uh, 
it does something to you emotionally. You feel frustrated. When you feel frustrated when you're learning, that is your brain reaching out to make new connections. When you're lifting a weight, let's say you're curling a weight, after a while, you're going to feel a burn in your arm. That's your muscle saying, you know, it's that, that, that you're tearing down the muscle, you feel that burn. It's the repairing of it that makes it stronger. Well, your brain doesn't burn. You just feel frustrated. If you're reading something that you understand, you don't feel frustrated. Frustration is an emotion. It's an emotional response to a chemical reaction in your brain. The chemical reaction being, what the hell is going on here? Your little dull dendrites. Say, ah, there we go. I get it. And when they do that, you go, ah, I get it. That's simplified. There's a neurobiologist out there somewhere saying, oh, he's killing the description of this. But in a very simplified way, that's what's going on. So the more, if you want bigger muscles, you have to hurt your muscles. There's no other way. Uh, you, you have to work out to the point where you tear down the muscle fiber so it rebuilds stronger. That's what you do. So you're going to be in pain for a couple of days in a certain muscle area after you know that's the pain you want. That's the good pain because your muscle will, will grow back stronger. If you want to learn, you have to push yourself into frustration. You have to step out into areas you don't know the answers to. You have to read stuff where you go, I don't understand what this means. Good. The next time you read it tomorrow, you'll know a little bit more. Much like the first time you bench, you might bench, well, for somebody who's just showing up, let's just say you might be able to bench 120 pounds. Uh, but after a, a couple of weeks, you're at 130. After a couple of weeks, you're at 140. Every time you go back, you're a little bit stronger. It's the same thing with learning. You may be frustrated in learning something. I'm not getting this. Let it. Leave it. That's your muscle saying, I can't do another rep. Leave it. Come back to it in, in, in the next day. You're, 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 you will have made new connections or a couple new connections along the way. Read it again. You won't be as frustrated. Much like working out, you know, if you're curling uh, 30 pound, uh, 30 pound dumbbells, maybe you get to about eight reps before you start to fail. Well, the next time you do it, maybe you get to about nine reps before you start to fail, then 10, then 11. There's your muscle getting stronger. So Next time you read it, oh, a little bit more will come into focus. A little bit more until you get it. So um, frustration should not be seen as, oh, I don't get it. I can't do it. It'd be the same as saying after eight reps, oh, I can't do it. I should be able to do 100. No, not without building up to that. Now, anybody who's never been in a gym, who's never lifted a weight on their first time is not going to be very good at it. Is, is it genetic or can you build muscle? You can build muscle. Now, some people do have a genetic gift in, in that they have a better body shape on which to build muscle on. It just means I got to work harder. I may not get to their level, but I can still look damn good. Some people may have a genetic gift cognitively. You can get there. You're just going to have to work harder, but they always may be just a little bit out of your reach. But that doesn't mean you can't improve over time. Your benchmark for everything should be you at some previous point in your life, not somebody else, right? Uh, I passed level three last February and played a part in it. I'm giving the prompts you to, oh, okay. Oh, I see. Exam on the 18th, February. Yeah, level three this year is before level one. That's Usually it's level one, level two, level three, but there's only a level one and a level three exam, which I, you know, I think makes a lot of sense. Usually it's level one, then they have level three. Well, they're bringing level three up front. If it takes longer to grade than level one, bring it up front. We should get all the results out at the same time now. In level three, Q&A is not available for videos. Was a great tool to, oh, okay, I've already answered that. Yeah, 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 yeah. What should my strategy be if I'm starting the prep today for level three? I'm a working professional. Uh, uh, and I've already answered uh, this one uh, as well, is determine how much time you have available. Uh, um, start with what it is that you have to do in your life first. You have obligations, you have work, you have family, you have this, that. Fill your calendar with your obligations and whatever you have left over is what you have for this. If it's not enough time, well, then you got to play the sacrifice game. What did you put in your schedule that you must now sacrifice, right? 
Would you consider a pivot to teaching something unrelated to finance? Well, I, I don't know. Um, if 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 something really uh, excited me, perhaps uh, I thought about uh, you know philosophy or poetry because I really like that stuff, and 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 uh, I think that um, the way it's has been taught sometimes ends up being almost painful for students because there's so much meaning that you can take from that. And there's so there's, there's just so much that you can bring into your life and so many answers you can find in, in those things that I think that if they were just presented a little bit better, uh, but it's, it's bandwidth, it's having the time to get things done. Uh, so, you know, what I said about trade-offs, I'm there as well. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. Well, how much more time do I need? I haven't got it. What am I willing to sacrifice? At this point, not much. So new things don't find their way in as much because I just don't have the time. Uh, what advice would you give to a 24-year-old to live a fulfilled life? Well, first bit of advice is don't start thinking about how to live a fulfilled life at 24. Just be 24. Uh, fulfillment will come later on. Uh, you know, if you start now, in 20 years, you'll feel robbed of your youth. And you will not have lived a fulfilled life. Uh, but if you let it go till you're in your mid-30s, you might feel that you've wasted your life on an ill-spent youth. But there is no ill ill spent time because it does make you wiser, right? So be twenty four. Just just be 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 twenty something for as long as you can. There's plenty of time to worry about how to live a fulfilled life uh, later on. Um, I would, uh, at your age, I think I would list what's important to me and what do I believe in. It's not as simple as what you think it is, right? You can't have 50 things that are important to you and believe in everything you hear. You have to have some core belief that drives you. And some people, it's religion, right? That that is their core belief and they live a life according to that belief. Well, then that's fine. Whatever it is that is your core belief will guide your, your moral center uh, and, your, uh, and your ethics. This was, if you want to see how that changes things, I think a good book, it's an old book, but a good book to read on that uh, is uh, Weber's uh, The Protestant Ethic. Uh, and the argument laid out there was that, was that the Northern European countries were so much more prosperous than the Southern European countries because of Protestantism because Catholicism really held you back, whereas Protestantism allowed you to express uh, uh, your, your true abilities, that under Catholicism, wealth was looked down on and frowned upon, but under Protestantism, it was not. It was, it was uh, uh, sort of, to put it in an easy way, you know, God's way of saying that they approved of the life that you're living. Uh, uh, by, uh, you know, allowing you to be blessed with this, with this sort of life. It was a demonstration. Um, so it's just changing, changing the religion, still the one God, but you don't need an institution uh, mediating your relationship with God. Protestantism said you can have a direct relationship with God and all this other stuff that that institution is telling you is because they want your money. You don't have to do it. You can live your life like this. And it did fit the data, you know, and it wasn't, you know, the, the, the essay I wrote on that at the time, the conclusion I got to, it was not that Protestantism created so much more in you. It's just that Catholicism, the way it was then, restricted you. It really crushed the entrepreneurial spirit. So Catholicism was more like a dam that just stopped the natural flow of the river. But there again, take take a look at that Catholicism versus Protestantism, and what you believe in changed uh, how you saw outcomes. One saw a certain outcome as kind of immoral; the other saw it as your moral imperative, as part of your moral imperative. <clears throat> we have the same thing going on today with the culture wars. 
where the further left you go, the more offensive wealth is. Whereas the further right you go, uh, the more wealth is a reflection of the process that you created something and you are being rewarded for what you created. People willingly entered into transactions with you and said, I want your output and you became successful. Seen from one side, there's nothing wrong with that. Seen from the other side, you almost feel ashamed that you have to, and, and have to hide it from them. So determine what it is that you believe in. Number one, that will set your, your center. Uh, uh, of, on which you judge yourself by. Don't give a shit what other people judge you by. Judge you by your own by your own yardstick, which is usually the more critical yardstick. No one will be harder on you than yourself. Uh, figure out what you believe in, and and define what a fulfilled life means. For for example, and I've used this this example in 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 other videos. Um, if, if we look at the big one of the big questions today of, of how come there are not more women represented in the C-suite in uh, organizations, uh, and it's the wrong question. It's the right question to ask if you're a Marxist because a Marxist sees class struggle and they only see class struggle. So whenever there's any disparities, it's always a class struggle. There's always something, right? Uh, a Marxist would see class struggle in heaven between the angel class and the afterlifers. They're, they're just programmed to see class struggle. That doesn't make it so. A feminist would never ask that question. A feminist would ask a different question. A feminist would say, how come more women are not willing to sacrifice uh, their friends, their family, and their relationships for their career? Um, women, on average, live longer than men. Women, on average, die happier than men when you measure uh, the happiness of their life. Women, women almost invariably score higher than men because they prioritize relationships over their career. That's what I mean by what's important to you. What does a fulfilled life mean? That does not mean it's the same for everyone. What does it mean for you when you say, I want to live a fulfilled life? On average, if a woman would find a fulfilled life, one full of family, friends, and relationships, whereas a man might say high prestige, high career, whatever the case is, but nobody on their deathbed ever says, I regret not spending more time at the office. So in the end, who's really making the best decisions? Who's making the optimal decisions based on that? It seems women have already figured out what's important in life, and it's not the office. So it's not that they're underrepresented in the C-suite. They're simply overrepresented in relationships. Overall, if you think of any extended family, who's the glue that holds that family together? It's typically a woman. Most families are typically matriarchal, not patriarchal, uh, because they are unwilling to sacrifice superficial things like their career and time in the office for what's really important. So to sum up, What's important to you and what do you believe in? Not easy things to answer. It does require you to really, really search uh, 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 your, your, you know, your feelings and, and, and your belief system and, and coalesce around something that you truly believe in. Do you believe in the power of, of, of society? Do you believe in the power of the individual? Who has precedence? Is it society that has precedence and you carve out a space for yourself with what's left over? Or is the individual prominent, but an individual within society? It matters. It does matter for how you will conduct yourself and, and, and what you think will be important. That's a long answer for a 24-year-old, but uh, if you can really think more, be 24 for a while, but at the same time, think about what you believe in, right? And university or post-university is in the 20s. It's your formative year still. It's a great place to start really, really uh, coming together on what you do believe in. And that's why I think it's important uh, to, to read philosophy uh, uh, and, and to see what other people thought and say, well, do I believe in that? Or this person said it in a way that I couldn't have said it, but I felt this way, but it's nice to see it in words because, yes, this is exactly how I feel and exactly what I think. Um, 
explore. Don't be afraid of ideas. All right. Uh, way too long of an answer, I think. When do you think the algorithm you're testing to answer questions will go live? Well, when go live, I don't know. Um, I'll know. We'll know in two, three weeks, really, uh, how good it is. And then we will. It's not a matter of, oh, it works here. Bang. It works here. Go a little bit bigger. Go a little bit bigger. Uh, 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 it failed here. Let's figure out what's wrong. Let's retreat a bit, figure out what's wrong. Let's try it again. Aha, great. So a lot of these things, anything like this is iterative, right? So I don't have an answer uh, on that one other than to say um, I think it's a priority, uh, leaning into it. And, and um, I know resources are being deployed on it now. I, I see progress on it on a daily basis. So let's see. Studying for August. Noted some of the ELC questions were not answered. Maybe the CFA added more questions that were not there before. Do you have a plan to answer the new questions? It's not important that we answer all the questions. Um, I've thought about this, and, and um, I used to do all, all, all of them. And then over time, I thought, when I do all of them, I don't know that I'm doing a lot of favors. So I'd see some new ones show up. Sometimes new ones would show up after after the fact, and I didn't know they were new until until uh, uh, later on. So I couldn't I couldn't update them uh, in the time that I was doing the video. They just showed up later, and then uh, and then over time, I just said, "Look, it's it's not important that I do them all, because if I do them all, I I take away from you uh, the ability to ride the bike without training wheels." Okay, so. If I do enough of them, I don't necessarily have to do all of them. Um, I don't know if I if I plan to answer them all over time. I know there are big changes coming to 2025, uh, which means that uh, almost all of level three, the most, if not all of level three, is going to have to be redone from the bottom up. Uh, and there are fewer EOC questions and more um, inbox uh, questions in the reading. So they're... I'll have to think about what, how I want to do that. But it's easier to answer all those questions because well, there aren't that many behind every every module. Wondering where you get your undergrad. A lot of universities are using the MBA as a cash cow by waiving GMAT and work experience requirements. Uh, there's a lot of competition especially in the United States. There's a lot of competition among universities. In fact, I think there are just way too many universities uh, in the U.S., over 3,000, I think, at last count, over over 3,000. Um, well, yeah, it's a cash cow. Uh, it does generate money. Waving GMAT and work experience, yeah. Um, uh, well, listen, when competition increases, enrollment decreases, you got to do something right. And enrollment, uh, across a higher education has been decreasing, has been decreasing faster for, uh, um, males and females, uh, without wandering into any culture wars. Let's just leave it at two genders. There has been decreasing faster for males and females. Uh, so this could be, uh, an attempt to say, well, uh, we'll waive this and we'll waive work experience. There are, there are lots of MBAs that were direct entry anyways. Uh, don't know if that is the best for you overall. I think that you get a lot more out of an MBA when you have some work experience behind you. Uh, waiving the GMAT could be, could be a competitive uh, thing or it could be a social thing, right? Is that... If the GMAT is seen as being racist in some way, because of course these days everything is, uh, then a virtue signaling university might cancel it to say, okay, well, look, at, we're part of the solution. Um, that does happen. So some of it could be social, some of it could be competitive, uh, some of it could be. You know, some university might say we have different measures uh, that we would use. I don't know. Um, 
but yeah, I think I think universities are due for a business model change, a dramatic business model change soon, because I don't know how they're going to compete with, in a digital world. Uh, and it's not a matter of they just bring their degrees digital. That's 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 not what's required at this point in time. Is 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 they have to be part of a broader solution, uh, and uh, they are a stale, dated organization with a lot of waste, a lot of waste. Uh, having been through the system, having worked in the system, I can tell you right now that you can bring a four-year degree down to three years with no loss of content. Why is it four? You can bring it down to three. And, 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 and I'm not even cutting. That's not cutting deeply. You can take a four and bring it down to three with no loss of content in terms of the richness of a person that you would be after three years. Okay. So, and I can do that just with some pe pencil strokes. So think about if you really redesigned it, you could do it in two years, 18 months to two years for an undergrad, uh, I think. And then from that undergrad, you can then bolt on certificates. You can then add on some certificates after the fact, but they're going to have to get a lot more. They're going to have to move away from this four year nonsense because it is nonsense. I mean, some of the courses that I saw, when I was an undergrad, some of the things you had to take, I thought, why, why, why do I have no inherent interest in this? And I'll never, ever, ever use it. HR had to take an HR course to this day. I don't even know why I've never once relied on it or used it or done anything with it whatsoever. Why not just leave HR for the really boring people who want to take HR? You know them. Everybody knows these people. The name Jennifer or or something like that. I guarantee you meet a Jennifer. She's in HR. They get all the Jennifers. I don't know why. Uh, what else we got here? Why CFA very concerned about exam questions despite being able to change questions constantly, asking the same question many different ways to differentiate candidates? Let me read that again. Why CFA concerned about exam questions despite being able to change questions constantly asking the same question many different ways to differentiate candidates who understand from who remember okay well when you say when they're concerned about exam questions i i don't know what you mean concerned about the integrity of the exam question well i i mean i think that goes without saying Do you mean in terms of uh, because they're not releasing the AM exam anymore, the real AM exam each year, that that's the issue? Um, they've they've addressed that. They want the ability to build a, a library of them such that when they give a level three exam, uh, they don't have to keep paying to have these questions written because they are expensive to have done. Uh, they are expensive and it's hard to find good writers. It's hard to find good writers. Mm. I mean, very concerned about not to share even in a broad way. While most exams don't care if you share. You mean to discuss it after the fact, to be able to discuss the question after the fact? The exams are given over multiple days. Uh, if you start, if there's a big discussion after day one of all the questions, oh, do you see the fixed income question? I answered 73. So did I. So did I. I answered 72. Damn it. I answered 73. I answered 70. Oh, okay. It's 73. I got my exam this afternoon. That's, that's a problem, right? I mean, you have to see that as a problem. Uh, why do you think the rapid advancement of AI and LLM specifically reduce the number of job opportunities in the financial analysis going forward? No, no, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, number one, they're hugely, it's hugely, hugely expensive right now, hugely expensive, uh, to run one of these. Uh, so most organizations are going to wait until this is way down the cost curve, two, three years. Okay. Number two, uh, it's a great enhancement for a good analyst 
but I don't think it replaces an analyst. It may replace some lower level data uh, uh, workers, uh, but as many that will lose jobs there, there will be jobs created in building these models and running these data centers. So uh, the there may be uh, some unacceptable outcomes for certain people because of this. It will obsolete the job they're doing or it will obsolete them. But net, it's a positive. On net, it's a positive. So all technology on net is a positive. I, I think that since the advent of the computers, there's been the Luddite cry of, oh my God, this is going to, this is, this is going to put everybody out of a job. The computer industry created way more jobs than the secretary pool ever did, right? Uh, with typewriters. Uh, and um, every industry that comes along is sort of the same thing, yet it ends up creating more and more and more sub-industries on that one industry that you can now do things that you could never do before, right? So it's how many online learning uh, businesses were created because of YouTube that never could have existed before. Uh, I could never have been possible in 1987, 1988, 1995, because I would have had to have a physical location somewhere. It would have caught, I, there was no way that I could have put stuff out for free to demonstrate what I can do. Uh, before I built a business, that simply wasn't available. Uh, before Amazon's EPUB, uh, if you were a good author that simply couldn't get a publisher, you, were, you weren't an author, period, end, end of story done over but now you can be and there are lots who have self-published epubs who have ended up selling a lot more than even they thought they would some of them have even been taken up and making into movies all without ever going through a publisher what will this create there was a great commercial great youtube commercial out like 15 15 years ago uh i forget who put it out but it was talking about uh, you know, in five years, universities will be training students on information that doesn't exist today for jobs that don't even exist today. You know, and it was just this, it had a whole bunch of facts about a bunch of things. I forget what it was, but it was really interesting. And then there was a follow-up video for that as well. I forget who put it out. I think, I think it might've even been Sony who put it out. Um, but this is, think about in five years, there will be job categories that simply don't exist today, uh, uh, requiring skills and experience that nobody yet has. That's how fast we're moving. You can't even predict uh, what growth will come from this. But yes, every time an industry dies, there will be what are referred to as unacceptable outcomes for certain people right uh will the may 2024 l2 candidates uh take the psm psm i'm not sure what psm is can you give your take on the concept of canadian experience for immigrants to canada does it mean to always start low? You see, I can't, I, I can't really speak to that because I'm, I'm, I'm not an immigrant. Well, I guess I was an immigrant uh, uh, when I was born. I, I immigrated uh, from my mother's womb, which was my home at that time. Um, but um, I don't know what their experience is because I'm here, uh, and I'm, for the most part of my life, have been distinctly Canadian uh, in, in both visual and, and psychological approaches to how I do things and in language. Uh, I don't know what the immigrant experience is uh, because I can't see the interactions they have through their eyes. So to, to be able to say what's the Canadian experience, I think you have to ask another immigrant what has been the Canadian experience. I don't know that my experience would be your experience. So I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, does it mean to always start out low? No, I don't think it does. Uh, there are uh, many that are 
Uh, well, my neighbor's a good example who, who's a vet, has his own clinic, lives in my neighborhood, so I know they're making money. Um, I'd say, well, next door, same thing. Um, I'd say there are quite a few in this neighborhood. So no, I, I, I don't think it always means to start out low. No, I, I, I don't, I don't see that, but you'd have to ask, you'd have to ask, and not just one, you have to ask many because one may have a negative, uh, a, a negative view and be unable to separate their experience from who they are. And maybe they just weren't nice people. Not everyone's a nice person, by the way. I don't know if you picked up on that. But no matter where you are in the world, no matter who you meet, no matter who you bump into, I would say that the term asshole is an equal opportunity employer. Uh, there is no discrimination in that category. They're everywhere. So asking somebody how they got along and hearing, oh, it sucks, it's this, it's that. Well, maybe they're an asshole and everyone treated them that way because they're an asshole. So that's why I say ask a bunch of people, ask good people. First of all, say, what do you think of that person? Good person or asshole? They're like, guy's a real asshole. Well, then I don't want to know what his experience was because it's going to be personal to that person, right? So not everybody with an opinion is, is somebody that should be listened to. We must first say, well, how did you get that opinion? Maybe it's your own fault, right? Uh, yeah, so just ask a bunch of people. But you'd have to ask other immigrants how their experience was. I can't. I can't answer that one for you. 50 days for uh, November level two. Uh, when should I opt for mocks? 28 days before. I don't remember most of the remaining subjects. So I think the complete EOCQ before mocks. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I would seem to think that 28 days before the exam, you want to take your first mock exam, uh, knowing that well, yeah, look, the score is not going to be that great, but I need a baseline. I need to baseline where I am right now. Because you may think, I should review, and you write your first mock exam, and you're perfect in quant. Well, then don't waste your time reviewing quant. Review it lightly, but now you know not to waste a lot of time on it. You, you at least know where to put the most time and effort without, without redoing something that you've already got. Right. So uh, I would say that you'd want to do the first mock about four weeks out. Not to test your knowledge, but to baseline what you have to figure out, okay, here's what I'm dealing with and here's how I'm going to progress, right? Uh, since exams are only half part of CFA, is it still advised to take level three if one doesn't have any relevant work experience lest one become overqualified? Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, um, yeah, well, you're right. You can't get those three letters uh, until you have past level three and have the work experience. And if you have the work experience, maybe there's no point racing to complete level three. Maybe you want to get work experience first. The danger with that is that you lose momentum on the, uh, on the studying part and that life starts to get too heavy and too intense. Uh, and then you, you, you can't ramp back up to level three. That if you are one exam away and you have the momentum of studying behind you, that knocking it out of the way uh, might help. Now, if you have a fear of saying, well, I don't want to look like I'm overqualified, just don't put it on your resume. Just don't put it on. You know, and in the interview, they say, so you're level two, say, so actually, level three. You can just add it there as an afterthought. You know, just don't put it on your resume. If, if you think it'll make you look overqualified, you don't have to tell people, right? Hmm. How can one improve his resume after having already passed CFA? Does it make sense to take additional courses? At no, no, I, I, I don't know that, that, that having more letters and, and more education uh, uh, really, uh, really matter. Um, so when improving your resume is, is two-sided, right? It's improving the presentation of what you already have, number one. For that, you really do need some kind of 
some somebody who's skilled in writing resumes or or somebody who's worked in an HR department who's seen thousands of them and knows, you know, here's what's going to get attention. So it might be improving the presentation of what you already have or enhancing what you have. Best way to enhance what you have, I don't know that unless if you have no letters, if you have no education, then you got to get some. But if you've got that, I don't know that more is going to do it. I think you want to show that you're far more well-rounded. Put some volunteering on there. Volunteer. It'll make you feel good. Volunteer for uh, a, a, a nonprofit somewhere. It'll make you feel good. And it 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 is impressive on a resume because you don't have to do that. Uh, can see if they expire if you don't use it for a long time. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Do you recommend to have a real trading account to apply your portfolio construction course? No, paper. Paper is a better finish the entire course before. You're going to open up a paper trading account, which is real, except none of the money's real. You're going to open up a paper trading account. Do not use real money. Do not. Because I am going to uh, give you things to do at some point, which are guaranteed losers. Like you're going to lose and I'm going to do that so that you, you know what it feels like to lose, but also how can we work our way out of trouble once we are losing? Is there a way to salvage this? So don't use real money. I'm 19. I have my level one exam this November. My question is that it'll be, I'll, I'll be eligible to appear for L2 and L3 in the next 18 months when I'll be 21. Should I clear this exam in one go? Yeah, I don't know that there's that there's any harm in getting that done. I don't know that there's any harm in that at all. Plus, you don't know what your uh, your pathway looks like. When I was 21, I you know PhD wasn't something I thought of. Um, so you don't know what your pathway is going to look like. Let's say that you get them all done and you end up loving education. It's probably going to be a lot easier uh, getting into a master's program with with the three levels behind you than otherwise. Uh, and honestly, uh, it, it's not the exams. Uh, I mean, there are people who passed their exams 20 years ago. The content today is significantly different than it was 20 years ago. So it's, it's, it's not a matter of, you know, trying to time it so that, that it's current with where, where you happen to be. Don't worry about that. If it's something that you want to do, if you think that you can get that done, sure. How much longer uh, do you think you'll be doing this kind of work? Incredible amount of value in these videos. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't, at this point, I am not seeing a date on the calendar at which I have a countdown. Usually when I want to be done with something, I'm counting down. I know I, I know how many days are in Canada and, and, and every day I'm trying to figure out, can I shave a day off? Can I, can I, that I know is done. I'm leaving and it's done. I, I know that leaving the industry. I don't have any such date in mind. I have, I, 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 I don't even have a hypothetical. Well, I'll do it a couple more years. It's, it's, once it's once I start thinking that I'm near the end, then then that's where you start saying, well, OK, maybe a couple more years and I'll be done. But I'm not even at that point yet. If I did stop, I would only start something else and be right back in the same situation I'm in right now where I'm doing something. So I may as well just keep doing what I'm doing because I like what I'm doing. But no, I have no uh, no desire to to finish. Uh, anytime soon. It's not even, it's not even, yeah, it, it's not even anything I'm thinking about. I'm not even thinking about thinking about ending, to use the Fed's words. We're not even thinking about thinking about having a conversation about whatever. I'm not even thinking about thinking about having a conversation about anything. Uh, in the essay questions, when question asks why an answer is correct, should we also explain why the other options are not only if it's a justify and only and only if the options have multiple characteristics? So let's say I give you three things and I say, pick the heaviest object and you say, I'm picking A because it, it weighs the most. You don't have to then tell me that B and C don't weigh as much because there's only one 
option to choose on. But if I said uh, choose the optimal thing and there were three characteristics on which you can choose uh, and I use the justify keyword, justify means you had no choice. You had to choose this one. There was no choice. There you would want to demonstrate that I could not have chosen B and I could not have chosen C. I can't choose B because of this and I can't choose C because of that. I can only choose A. That's a justification, not just a support. That's a justification, right? Uh, do you recommend FRM for someone working in front office? Well, front office, in front office of what? Uh, what about CAI? If, if you are doing any kind of um, asset management at all, uh, alternative investments, I think, is definitely something you'd want to think about. I don't. I, I I can't speak to CAIA directly because I'm not familiar with the uh, with the course content uh, or how how rigorous or how deep it goes. I'm I'm simply just not familiar with it. Um, I know that they were upset with CFAI at level three branching out into private markets, private uh, you know taking on a whole bunch of the private stuff, the alternative investments, and really expanding that. So I think they probably saw. That is a threat to their own domain. I don't think they handled it. I don't think they handled it well at all, but their reaction was their reaction. Uh, FRM, I think if you're going to be managing assets, uh, is useful. I think if you're going to be managing corporate assets, it becomes even more useful, right? So it depends on on um, where you're working uh, and, and, and what perspective uh, you're working from. From an analyst perspective, I think understanding how companies manage their risk, I think, can be important because then you can spot deficiencies in risk management uh, quicker than, than uh, somebody else who doesn't have an eye towards risk or can't recognize where risk lies. Uh, let's see. Uh, finished. Uh, I just went off the screen. Let's see. Where'd it go? Give me a second here. Ah, there we are. Uh, finished uh, L3, bought applied series yesterday. Is there any suggested sequence in listening to your sessions? No, there, uh, there isn't. And if you uh, look at the market outlook I posted today, uh, the first four or five minutes I explained the changes uh, that we're doing on Wednesday in the applied series. We're just moving some stuff around. You're not going to lose anything. It's just we're moving some stuff around and collapsing it into uh, four different folders uh, that does more streamline. But I don't have a, there's no recommended place to start. So you can start wherever, wherever you would like. Sitting in February, just enrolled. I'm not currently employed. Is there any hope? Well, you're, you're not employed. You're sitting in February, which means you have all day long for this. There's always hope, you know, but when you say, is there any hope? Any hope for what? I'm not quite sure what you're hoping for. Um, let's move away from the word hope. Hope is never a strategy. Uh, uh, so maybe reword that in a, in a different way so that I can understand what, what it is that you mean by where, where you feel there is a loss of hope. Um, and I would change the word hope to opportunity. Whenever we hope for something, uh, rather than saying, I hope this happens, try, try thinking about it in terms of opportunity. What is the opportunity for this to happen? And can I change the probabilities of those opportunities? Hope is something uh, um, that you have when you ask God for something. I hope you heard. Or she, she, there is an argument why the universe is, is why the universe would be female, not male. So it's possible God could be a she. Possible. In all of your uh, book questions, answering videos, you keep saying that this is not a question you will get in the exam because the answer is not in the vignette. How do they expect me to prepare well? Okay, so uh, there is a difference between questions. That, that are there to help you learn and questions which are there to test your knowledge. 
you can Google this uh, and do some reading on this. It's the difference between formative versus summative assessment. Formative assessment are questions that are designed to help you learn. They're not necessarily reflective uh, of the types of questions you'd see on an exam. Exam questions are summative assessments. They're there to test what you know, but in no way are there to help you learn anything. They're truly there to test what you know, so they're more direct. They're more, they're more fair. They're less reliant on you having to refer back to parts of the reading, right? Every, everything, everything for the answer you would have to know, whereas formative ones yeah, we'll we'll send you in different directions to answer the question or are longer uh, or more wordier than they need to be or take 15 minutes to answer, especially at level two uh, on the more quantitatively driven uh, sections because they're there to help you learn. They're not there to test you. Uh, build a strategy for CFA level three, February, 2024. I don't understand what you mean by build a strategy for level three. What does that mean? Build a strategy for level three to prepare for level three. Open the book to a page and start reading. Um, it's that straightforward. You should not need me to do this at this point. You should not even be asking this question at this point. This is your third dance. Uh, 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 and, how many uh, exams have you had at your undergrad, midterms and finals? Uh, how many uh, uh, courses have you had? Uh, how many classes have you gone to? How many books have you read? Case studies have you read? Assignments that you've written? Essays that you've written? I mean, at this point in your career, uh, you should know what works for you. This is not a level one exam. It's a level three. You've done level one. You've done level two. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have a question about, I need a strategy. Uh, you should not be that, uh, uh, you know, that lost in the wilderness on this one is you should be, you should be telling me, Hey, based on my experience in my past, this is my strategy. This is what works best for me. This is what has always worked for me in the past. Anytime I've done well, I've done this. I'm going to do that and lean into that. Uh, but to discover a process all over brand new each time you face an exam is to fail to take the weight of your experience with you and say, this is what has worked for me. Um, I haven't started preparing for February, I'm really stressed about it. Well, I can tell you how to start getting that stress down and start preparing. Uh, and you know, use some of the advice that I gave earlier is, is, is figure out what, how much time you have available for this and, and is it doable? If it's not, then either sacrifice or change your conditions. Changing your conditions means defer to August, right? You are in control of everything that happens to you. You control how you spend your time. You control when you write. You control everything. You, the locus, your locus of control should be internal, not external, but internal. Once you internalize your locus of control, then nothing, nothing happens to you. You happen to the world, okay? So if you can't get it done for February, get it done for August. If you haven't started yet, that's a decision you have consciously made every time you've decided I'm going to do something else instead of this. Either, either change your conditions uh, or uh, uh, change uh, the motivation, change the decision-making that you're making or, or that you're doing. What are views on Jordan Peterson? Um, I, don't, I don't really listen to him very much. He pops up on... on my YouTube landing page every now and then, but I, I don't seek him out. I don't follow him. I haven't read his book or anything. I think he's, he's, he's sharp. Uh, when I, I think he was uh, sort of an ac an accidental um, intellect, intellectual, I say accidental uh, is that there was a certain event, the, 
the pronoun, the the determination that you must use these pronouns uh, that that he pushed back on, and that sort of gave him, you know, some some celebrity status, and from there it 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 uh, it increased, and he was quite authentic at the time, which is which is appealing because you really just want some honesty from someone whether you agree with them or not just just be authentically honest for god's sake i'll determine whether i like what you have to say or not but don't tell me what i want to hear tell me what i have to hear and in the beginning that's what he did uh but i've seen some of his other videos and i thought "Mm, did you need to talk about that or did you need to say this so it almost seems like he's losing his authenticity because he's got the spotlight. And it almost seems as if now he's saying things to stay in the spotlight and attempting to make them authentic. And some of them aren't. And, and, and this is the problem with fame is one of the biggest fears people with fame have is losing that fame is losing the spotlight so that you end up doing or saying whatever you think you need to say to keep the spotlight on you. I think that's where he is right now, Uh, which is why I, you know, in the beginning I found him refreshing because it was just refreshing to listen to somebody be honest, to say something honest without having to to conform to an expectation of society or to say something you know, to, to, what is the expression, you know, uh, uh, go along to get along. Um, that's not him. And it was refreshing in the beginning. And I found some of his, some of his stuff good, but then I slowly drifted away when, when it seemed like, okay, now you're just saying stuff to keep the spotlight. Um, and, and that's a problem. I think when people, when people get a certain level of exposure, is you no longer know whether they're saying what they're saying because they truly believe in what they're saying or they're saying what they're saying because they think that's what's going to keep you listening. A good uh, assessment of that phenomena is REM's song, Losing My Religion, which is exactly what it's about, uh, is, is, is about losing your religion, losing your authenticity, Forgetting where you came from and who you are and no longer having an audience, but being beholden to your audience. So if you look at the second verse of that song, it says, that's me in the spotlight, losing my religion, trying to keep up with you. And I don't know if I can do it. Oh, no, I've said too much. I haven't said enough. It's all this uncertainty of, should I say this? Should I not say this? And, and I don't want to lose the spotlight. I am willing to lose my religion over this. I, I, I'll say whatever you want me to say. Just tell me what you want to hear and I'll say it. But please keep the spotlight on me. And I find that to be um, just unrewarding in a world that is so fake and phony now. That is so Instagram fake and phony where everything is set up, where everything is a lie, where you watch these videos of somebody handing money to a a hungry person on the street and it's all just a lie. It's all, they're all actors and it's all set up and it's all, it's everything's a lie that you want some real authentic voices you can still listen to. Some some truth in in all of that. And he was that. but lately I find that, that he's not. You don't have to have an opinion on everything and you don't have to release a video every four hours with an opinion on everything because you can't possibly be authentic and have that many opinions about all of those things at the same time. And I think that's one of the reasons why that song, Rich Men North of Richmond, uh, gained so much traction because the singer was not trying to say what his audience wanted to hear because he had no audience. So he was truly honest, and the emotion in his voice is honest. It's an honest song, and that's why it resonated with so many people, and that's why so many people felt so much emotion on it, because it was honest. Now, the danger 
for him is that he starts writing songs he thinks his audience wants to hear and loses his religion just so that he can stay in the spotlight. I guess I did have an opinion on it after all. When uh, somebody asked me what my opinion was, I guess that's my opinion, is, is that I, I just wish that he would return back to his religion and the spotlight will follow him. He doesn't have to chase the spotlight, and that's what he's doing right now. Like the second verse of that song says, uh, trying to keep up with you, and I don't know if I can do it. I've said too much. I haven't said enough. Uh, as I prep for level three, I'm having difficulty finding resources to use. I've used your lectures and uh, practice questions in the past too. Any uh, for other providers offering practice questions? At level three, that's a tough one. Um, that is tough at level three. I would say this. It, 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 it's going to be hard to find good good, uh, uh, good Q banks uh, on that. Having written many, many of them, I can tell you they're brutally time-consuming uh, because it's it's difficult to write a question without any leaks in it. Any leaks meaning that, oh, well, but it could be interpreted this way or that way. It's like, okay, I see that now. It's, it's, it's difficult to do other than silly little questions about memorization or recall or, you know, can you recognize an answer if you see it, but that actually get you thinking it's hard to do. Uh, but you don't need, you know, the, the, I think the, the disadvantage that CFAI has put out there from the beginning is that you need more multiple choice questions. You need more multiple choice questions to practice. I need more structured response. I need more multiple choice. I need more vignette. I don't think, I don't think that's true. To learn, you don't necessarily need more multiple choice questions. You just need more opportunities to test yourself, right? I mean, what does it matter what the question looks like as long as it tests you? So Reddit is a great community with a bunch of people who ask a lot of questions. So you have all of these questions every day that are being posted to Reddit. Go answer those. There is the biggest Q bank in the marketplace right there is Reddit. And it doesn't have to be in the form of ABC. It could be anything, an open-ended question. There's an opportunity to provide a structured response answer that tests your knowledge. Because all you're really interested in is, I want to be assured that I know that I know this. So I need some assessments to test me. They don't have to be multiple choice questions all the time, right? They could be of any form any form at all, well, go to Reddit. There's there's the best, the most updated Q bank that you can ever have, and they are open-ended questions which uh, have maybe more complex answers, but your answer is going to be a teaching answer. You will never learn more than when you teach somebody else, never. Use that. It's a free resource that happens to be there. Right. So use that and don't hide behind a screen name. OK, use your real name. Use your real name because it builds social credit. It builds some social credit at the same time, because now you, you, you you'll improve to a point where you're giving back to the very community that you're part of. And, and, and by giving back to that community, it gets you known and who knows who you bump into and they see your resume and they name you go. That's that guy from Reddit. Hey, he really knows his stuff or she really knows their stuff. So use your own name, build your own credit. Don't hide behind a screen name. I, I, I find that unsatisfying when, when, when you have, you know, people hiding behind screen names. Well, let's see. Does your applied market course contain statistical arbitrage? Algorithm trading. If not, do you plan doing courses on these? Stat Arb is is going to be difficult for a retail investor to do with the data stream that you're going to get. Um, that's for larger institutions who have, who, who have, um, who have a team that can build those models uh, and that have uh, a data feed that allows them to capture that at a, at a, at a, fairly fast pace. 
algorithmic trading that's easy to do algorithmic trading is any trade that that, that you can that you can uh put down to a set of rules uh and trade those rules so uh in the portfolio construction series we're doing uh what's called an allocation factory on freeport uh by selling every week we sell a two-week option every week you sell a two-week put at a 60 delta because you're trying to allocate, get an allocation of 1,200 shares. Uh, and you just keep doing that. Uh, and you can program the whole thing that once you get up to 600 shares, you then start to add a 10 delta call. Once you get to 700 shares, maybe a 15 delta call. And so that you'll have your allocation along a smooth, uh, if, if you allocate it over, let's say, half of them get put to you uh, and you want 1,200 shares and you're selling one per week, um, you're allocating over a six month period, uh, you're basically trading on the six month moving average, right? And generating revenue uh, uh, with the calls and the puts. You can completely uh, automate that. So algorithmic trading is not difficult to do. It's anything that you can, that is rules based. Stat ARB on the other hand uh, is, requires a lot of data analysis up front. Um, and the ability uh, oftentimes to trade very quickly. So I don't know that stat arb would be something that I would get into. So I'll say no on the first one, but yes on the second. Uh, if you live in Canada, which pathway uh, be a more lucrative com commercial banking or investment, investment banking? Hands down, investment banking, investment banking. I just don't know how big that sector is in Canada. I remember we had hit, uh, I remember we had a uni statistics exam where we could use anything. Yes, yes, that, 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 that is possible for a statistics exam. Um, open book is not uncommon uh, at all. Uh, so yeah, I, I, think, I think for something like that, it makes sense. CFA exams are so hard to pass that even using anything without understanding would not, uh, would not matter. Um, well, let's say that you had an open book exam for CFAI, uh, level one, 90 seconds on average, uh, uh per question. You're not looking shit up. <laughs> You're not looking stuff up. There's no time. There's no time. Um, locates the meaning between good and evil. Well, I'm not sure what that means. It's a statement. I'm 19. I can finish CFA in 18 months. My IQ is 200. Mm. My IQ is 200. Can I beat? Uh, I don't know if you're trying to make a point about something. I have plumbing experience. How fast can I become Jesus? With the... Okay, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, it seems breaking into the buy side only gets more difficult. True. True. That is the side you want to be on. What do you think it would take? Accept capital uh, to launch my own fund and start applying my CFA knowledge in the real world. Um, social capital. Uh, who who do you know and who knows you? Uh, it is uh, competitive, like investment banking. The buy side is where everybody wants to be. Uh, so you are in competition with uh, with a lot of people, uh, a lot of well placed people who are in line way ahead of you regardless of their merit they are in line ahead of you because of where they went to school what their last name is who they know who knows them who knows their parents whose parents you know um who likes you who doesn't like you it's there's never you know to say that we should live in in a world where merit means everything merit only gets you so far okay i gotta work with you so right away, I got to like you. We have, we have to get along. Now, you may be the best qualified for the job, but you're so difficult to work with. You're so difficult to talk to. I can't understand you half the time. doesn't matter what your merit is, right? It matters. Can I get along with you? Do I like you? Whatever. Because there could be 10 people who could do this job. But there has to be an interaction with the rest of the people in the group. And that interaction has to be beneficial and not negative. So um, 
you know, building your social capital matters because you are embedded in an organization with other people. You are a personality that has to be dealt with, right? Uh, your merit can be improved over time. So you can take uh, somebody who's got a great personality and you can make them better merit-wise. You can take somebody with a terrible personality with great merit. Personality is um, more Im immutable than merit. I can educate you, but changing personality is a huge task and troublesome. So uh, if you are... Easy, easy to get along with and people like you, you'll build social capital quickly. People like to be around people they like. People like to be around nice people and good people. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 it's not just, you know, it's not just a merit, uh, a, a merit pathway. So it is, you know, the other side of it is you gotta, you know, who knows you, who knows you and who do you know? Um, yeah, um, volunteering, I find, uh, helps a lot because you bump into other people who know other people. You get invited here, you get invited there, you meet these people here, you meet those people, and it's, you know, you can have a list of stocks you follow and you know everything about, or you can have a list of people you hang out with that like you. Which one do you think will get you further, All right? Uh, career opportunities after completing CFA level three. That's too, too broad of a question. I don't know that I could, that I could answer that. Let me, uh, where are we? We're two, three hours in. I'm getting tired of sitting on this chair. So let me just see if I can get to some questions here that I haven't answered again and again. Beth Shania Twain song. I really don't know. Even though I went to high school with her. And I did. I did go to high school with her in uh, in Timmins. She was one grade ahead of me. And she was dating a guy who was the sister of like the group I hung out with, the girl in here. Her brother was dating her. and They would show up places. You didn't know who they were back then. I mean, like back then it was just Eileen. Everyone knew her. It was just Eileen. That was her name. But uh it was years and years and years later before somebody pointed out that, uh, you know, that's Eileen, right? I said, no way. So, so, and I was never a country fan, so I don't know. Favorite section in L3 content, probably fixed income. Uh, capital market expectations, yeah. Uh, should I make a run for February? I just took L2 in September, hoping to pass on October 5th. I'm single, no family, uh, no events, holidays, plans, can study 20 plus hours, a fast learner. Sure. If, if you think, it's not a matter of what I think. If you think you can because you have that amount of time, sure. Gave uh, August 23, missed a couple of questions. How much would that affect my chances of clearing the exam? Well, I mean, it's going to affect your score. Um, but the level three exam is not one that you should aim for a hundred percent. That's an ear. That's an, that, that's just, it's, it's not a realistic goal to aim for a hundred percent. Um, it is an exam where you should aim for 75%. Uh, and that's a good, that's a, you get 75. That's a pass. That's a pass, which means it's okay to give up on a few questions, you know? So you read a question, you go, don't have a clue. Move on. Don't waste any time on it. You don't know it. The answer is not falling out of your head onto the page. Move on. Just move on. It's okay to leave a couple blank and use that time to spend more time on other ones that you have a higher probability of getting because you, you recognize the pathway to the answer. So it's okay to leave some blank. It is okay. It's not okay to leave a lot of them blank, but it's okay to walk away from a few. How is Costa Rica? Hope you are settled. I uh, I bought a house. It's not going to close uh, for a little while. So I'm in Canada. This is my Canadian home behind me now that it's finished and upgraded. And I don't know if you noticed the doors. I changed all the doors uh, to uh, cherry wood doors from the builder doors. And 
Uh, now that the last upgrade is Tuesday, there's one little piece missing in the bathroom and then it gets listed. So after all of that, now it's up for sale. Yeah, well, that's fine. Uh, but I will, I'm, my goal is to get there by mid-December. It was supposed to be mid-January, but I'm trying to move it up to mid-December. And then I'll let you know how it is. 7 to 10% monthly return realistic trading equity. <laughs> no. no it's, I would not aim for 7 to 10% monthly return. I don't think it's realistic. Are there people who are capable of getting it? Yes, there are. Yes, it is. It is possible to do it. Brutally difficult in this environment. Much easier to do with trending markets. But when you have the markets that we have, it's brutally hard to do. Um, so I don't know that that is realistic every month. Uh, I think it's realistic for some months. I think that if you aim for 2% a month, that's far more realistic. That's still 24% a year, which is which is significant, but realistic. So 7 to 10, no, because you're, you're talking about as much as 120% return every year. No, no. You The amount of risk that you'll be taking on from a distribution perspective and probabilistically speaking means you'll get wiped out at some point. You'll get wiped out at some point. More likely God is a they. <laughs> Do you recommend stock track as a paper trading platform? Yeah, you got to pay for stock track, but it's a good one. Um, if you have interactive brokers, you can just ask for a paper trading portfolio and you get a million dollar US portfolio. Paper, it's not real. Don't try to withdraw anything from that. What's your take on balancing? Uh, I can't see that word, balancing health with career. Um, well, I, 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 I don't know that I would say that a balance needs to be struck between them. I think they're both priorities. So I don't know that having a career means that I have to sacrifice my health. And I don't think that trying to have good health means I have to sacrifice my career. It's my choice what I eat. It's my choice if I walk up the stairs or take the elevator. It's my choice if I go to the gym uh, in the morning uh, rather than sleeping in till 8 o'clock. It's, it's my choice what I do. Uh, I have the choice. I, I don't know that I have to sacrifice one for the other. So I don't know that that is a balance. I think a balance you know, between work and personal life, I think, yeah, you got to find a balance between the two there. But I don't know that that health, that in anything I do, I would sacrifice my health for my career. Uh, I think I think they are both priorities that that neither one needs to be weighed against the other. Uh, where do you think? Uh, uh, where do you think opportunities lie? Uh, for retail investors in the upcoming future? Well, the advantage retail investors have is they're small and they can move fast. So markets are generally efficient, but have a lot of errors in them. Efficiency does not mean they're correct. Efficiency just means information shows up in the price. Well, the interpretation of that information could be wrong, but it shows up in the price. Large institutions can't really do what small traders can do you they can't really play a lot play around a lot with small cap stocks with small floats um, options are options leave big footprints um, so you know there's usually some avoidance of that so the retail trader has a lot more uh, advantage because they're not burdened by scale they're not burdened by size the bigger you get the harder it is to do trades that are meaningful that can be done big enough without, without the big risk that goes with it. So, um, you know, you get to a certain size where even selling 20 puts on a stock can't even move the needle. So, but, you know, to do more than 20, 
may may be too risky given given what it is you're trying to get done. So um, the small investor that can you know that's playing around with two, three, four options on 15, 20 different stocks uh, can 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 do what large institutional investors would like to do at scale, but simply can't do because that scale doesn't exist. Uh, and I think we're done. I think we leave it here. Um, I'm looking at uh, other questions. If I missed any questions, uh, sorry for that. But uh, we are at three hours and four minutes. We are at 4.03. Uh, and it's time, time to say goodbye. All right. Or as they say in Italian, I think I have it right, Conti Partiro. Conti, Conti Partiro. Partiro. Yeah, something like that. I only way I know that is because it's a it's a song. Uh, okay. Uh, that's it. Uh, that's it. That's it. I will uh, see you uh, somewhere out there or on the site. I will uh, click uh, end stream here in uh, as soon as I finish the sip of coffee. Sip of cold coffee now. It's been here for three hours, but what saves it is the maple syrup. Even cold, it's a great cup of coffee. Do not deny yourself the pleasure any longer. If you're not putting maple syrup in your coffee and having ca co coffee Canadiana, you're denying yourself one of the greatest pleasures in life. With that, I will leave it. Ciao.